Good, mo good morning. We are live from Council Chambers. Before we begin, I will go over the emergency response plan for this room. In an emergency, everyone must evacuate through the nearest safe exit. Those seated in the gallery take direction from council to evacuate. Council takes direction from the meeting clerk to evacuate. After evacuating the room, please proceed to a stairwell. Take the stairs to the ground level and evacuate the building through the doors marked emergency exit and go to a master point. Do not take an elevator or walk through the city room. Anyone with limited mobility should identify themselves to security or the meeting clerk during an evacuation. Finally, please speak with security or the meeting clerk if you require first aid. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order and begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, at this time, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and the Métis homeland and acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. Uh, I will also do a roll call of my council colleagues, starting with Councillor Wright. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Principe. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. I had, and I have to say I'm missing out on the, on the, on the memo on the jersey. <laughs> <laughs> but good so job. There will be many times where we can wear jerseys. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Councillor oh, Bear so he is not with us this morning. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. Good morning. And yeah. Councillor Jans. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, um, so just before we uh, move to the adoption of the agenda, I actually want to take a moment to recognize some special guests that we have in chambers with us this morning. Uh, so we have uh, the grade ones from Holy Family uh, in Ward Spomatapi who are joining us. Hello. <laughs> and uh, their teacher is Renee Nehow Nehowski. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, are you doing kind of the full tour? Are you just starting out? Oh, well, that sounds amazing. I'm so happy you get to check out all these amazing city facilities. So um, you'll have to report back and tell us what your favorite is. Okay, thanks for joining us and feel free to, to stick around and listen in. <clears throat> All right, so uh, moving on to adoption of the agenda. Um, can I get a motion for the adoption of the agenda? I'll move that the April 22nd, 2024 City Council Public Hearing Meeting Agenda be adopted with the following change. Uh, the deletion of item 3.8, Charter Bylaw 20797, uh, to allow for light industrial and small commercial businesses, Prince Rupert. Second. Okay, uh, please vote on adoption of the agenda. Councillor Piquet? I am a yes. Thank you, Councillor Piquet. We have a vote. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, excellent. Um, and protocol items, uh, none that I'm aware of. Uh, so that means we can move on to the explanation of the public hearing. And um, 
before I do that, I also just want to uh, talk a little bit about <clears throat> some of the, the expectations we have for our public hearings um, and any public meeting we have in City Hall. Uh, so before we begin our discussion, I want to share um, what we expect for conduct of everyone participating to ensure a safe and inclusive environment and workplace. These expectations apply equally to both in-person and virtual attendees. Hearing from the public is an important part of Council's process to ensure we hear the full diversity of opinions that exist in our community. As meeting chair, I have a responsibility to ensure the safety of all participants in today's meeting. As part of that responsibility, inappropriate comments or gestures will not be tolerated. If they occur, I will direct the clerk to immediately remove anyone engaging in such behavior. The type of behavior that will result in removal from the meeting includes making disrespectful comments directed at individual staff members or other public speakers or using profane language. Responsive, or responsive behaviors to show support or dissent, such as shouting, cheering, clapping, or using the chat or emotion response features in the Google Meet are also not permitted. I will not provide any additional warnings, and once removed, the person will not be permitted to rejoin the meeting. This meeting is being live streamed and everyone is welcome to view the live stream online. Uh, again, my role as the chair is not to moderate the nature of the content being discussed, but to ensure chamber behaviors are maintained to support a safe, respectful, and neutral space for my colleagues, city employees, and the public. Uh, I thank everyone in advance for your respectful participation in today's discussion. Uh, so, for today's public hearing, uh, the clerk will call out the bylaws to be dealt with. Uh, I will call out the names of people registered to speak to each bylaw. Next, council members will select the bylaws that they wish to discuss and vote on any bylaws that have not been selected for discussion. Council will then deal with each of the bylaws that were selected for discussion and debate. Uh, for each item, administration will first provide an overview of the bylaw. Members of the public who have registered to speak will then be invited to make their presentations. Those in favor will speak first in panels, followed by those opposed in panels. Each person will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer in council chambers. The timer light on the podiums will be green for the first four minutes, turn yellow when there is one minute remaining, and flash red when the five minutes are up. If you're participating virtually, you may wish to use a timer of your own. When everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions of you or other panel members. For this reason, you may wish to remain in the meeting until all questions have been asked of your panel. After comments from the public, council may ask questions of city administration. After all questions of administration have concluded, I will ask council if they wish to ask any further questions of those who have presented in response to new, informa in response to new information that may have arisen during the during the public hearing. Therefore, or thereafter, council may close the public hearing and debate the bylaw. If you're participating virtually, please remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out to the office of the city clerk uh, using the contact information provided in your confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. If you're here with us in person, the clerk will guide you to your seat when it's your turn to speak. In the event of an emergency, please follow the clerk's directions to evacuate. Uh, city staff will direct you to your muster point. Uh, so at this time, um, uh, I'll ask the clerk to please call the bylaws. Thank you, Chair Salvador. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1, bylaw 20749, to close a portion of 202 Street Northwest, Stillwater? I have uh, no one speaking in favor or and no one uh, registered in opposition. Is there anyone to speak to bylaw is is there anyone to speak to item 3.2 charter bylaw 20766 to allow for larger scale parks and amenities Edgemont Rosenthal and Glen High Glen Ryden Height. I have no one registered in favor or in opposition. Is there any item, items 3.3 .3 and 3.4 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.3, .3, Glen Ryden Height Municipal Reserve Removal? Or item 3.4, Charter Bylaw 20799 to allow for parkland development that is intended to serve educational, recreational, and community needs, Glen Ryden Height. Uh, in favor, I have uh, Corey Churchill to answer questions only, Janice Lee to answer questions only, and uh, Neil Asadiak to answer questions only. 
and, and nobody in opposition. And can we confirm they are, in, they are online or they are oh, here? Absolutely. Um, uh, so, Corey Churchill, we have joining remote. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Janice Lee is in person. Hello, good morning. And Neil is also in person. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Sabado. Is there uh, item, items 3.5 and 3.6 will be dealt with together? Is there anyone to speak to bylaw 20804 to amend the boundary of the North Saskatchewan River Valley area redevelopment plan? Or item 3.6, charter bylaw 20307 to allow for a range of small scale housing to preserve natural areas and parkland and to allow for storm water management infrastructure, ASTA. Uh, yes, so in favor, we have Shane Guerin to answer questions only, uh, who's in person. Okay, uh, he'll be here in a couple minutes. Uh, we also have Keith Davies to answer questions only uh, in person. Excellent. Um, and we have no one in opposition. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.7? Charter bylaw 20798 to allow for a range of small and medium scale housing, smaller scale parks and amenities, and infrastructure systems, and a stormwater management facility, the orchards at LSLE. Yes, so in favor, we have uh, Amy Stewart to answer questions only, uh, remote. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we also have Peter Sukalas, uh, who is joining remotely. Uh, good morning. Good morning. And we have no one registered in opposition. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to bylaw item 3.9, charter bylaw 20800 to allow for medium scale housing Windsor Park? Yes, in favor. We have Jacob DeWang joining remote. Jacob, are you with us? Yeah, hi. Good morning. Um, we have uh, Marij Khan, remote. Marij, are you with us? Okay, we'll check back later. Uh, we have Andrew Bembridge joining remotely. Andrew? We'll circle back. Uh, we have Marcelo Figuera in person. Good morning. Uh, we have Jared uh, Althaus in person. Good morning. Uh, we also have uh, Mason Vondero in person. Good morning. And Mark Huberman uh, to answer questions only joining remotely. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Richie Lamb uh, to answer questions only remote. Okay. Uh, and we also have Elaine Solas uh, for questions only in person. Good morning, Elaine. Good morning. Uh, great. And then um, opposed in opposition, we have Joe Miller, remote. Joe, are you with us? Okay. Karen Hughes, joining remotely. Devin Beggs, joining remotely. Here. Good morning. Uh, and Julia Parker who is remote. Okay, we'll loop back to those speakers when it's time, um, but that is all. Thank you. Is there, uh, is there anyone to speak to item 3.10, Charter Bylaw 20736, Omnibus Test Amendment to Zoning Bylaw 20001? Uh, yes, we have uh, Shane, in, sp in favor we have Shane Guerin uh, in person. Um, who is joining later is what I hear. Uh, and Elise Shillington in person. Good morning, Elise. And in opposition, we have Elaine Solis, who is in person. Great. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much to uh, the clerk. Um, we will now move to... Uh, selection of items for debate. So I will look to the board uh, to see 
which items we will have on the docket. Okay. Um, I will. <laughs> I will select uh, item. 3.9, because we have speakers. Um, I will also select 3.10. And yeah, that's, uh, that's what I will select. Is there anyone else who would like to select items? Okay, uh, not seeing any. Councillor, um, we just have one registered speaker for 3.2 uh, in opposition. Oh, they just registered? Yes. Oh, okay. In, in opposition, 3.2. 3.2. Yeah. Uh, Edgemont, Rosenthal, Glen Riding Heights? Yes. Okay. Um, can we... I don't have their name in front of me. Brent, Brent Fullerton. Okay, Brent, and joining virtually? Re remote. Remote? Yeah. Brent, are you with us this morning? We'll check back with Brent then, and I'll um, I'll select three point two then. Okay. Uh, and is Brent part of any organization, or just uh, did he register as a part of an organization or not? We don't have no? organizations. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we've selected items for debate. Uh, Councillor Cartman, would you like to move? Um, bylaws that we have dealt with? I would. Uh, question for the clerk. Do we need the recommendation in 3.3 before or after moving the bylaws? Or is it independent? I think it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then I will move first reading of item 3.1, 3.3, pardon me, 3.1, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, Councillor, can we, can we uh, move to close uh, public hearing for those items? I thought that's what I was doing. Okay, I, I'll start again. Yeah, I'll start thank again. You. I will move closure of the public hearing on item 3 3.1, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.7. 3 3 Second. Uh, please vote on closure of public hearing. Confirming Councillor Rutherford, you are with us. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the vote. It's carried. Okay, thank you. I'll move first reading uh, of items 3.1. 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, and 3.7. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. It's carried. I will move second reading of those aforementioned items. Second. Please vote on second reading. Councillor Tang. Sorry, I voted uh, in East Red, yes. Thank you, Councillor Tang. We have voted vote. Display the vote. That's carried. I will move consideration of third reading of those same aforementioned items. Second. Please vote for consideration. We have all the votes. Display the vote. That is carried. 
Councillor Salvador, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20749, charter bylaw 20799, bylaw 20804, charter bylaw 20307, and charter bylaw 20798. Second. Please vote on final reading. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. It's carried. Councillor Salvador, I'll move the recommendation in item 3.3. <laughs> Do you want me to read that in? Uh, yes, please, Councillor okay. Cartmel. So I will move the following recommendation. Uh, one, that the removal of municipal reserve designation from the lands illegally described as lot 1MR, block 12, plan 172398, as shown in attachment one of the April 22, 2024 Financial and Corporate Services Report FCS 02391 be approved. And two, that a designated officer within administration notify the registrar of the Northern Alberta Land Titles Office that the provisions of the Municipal Government Act RSA 2000 CM-26 have been complied with and request the registrar to remove the designation of municipal reserve from lands legally described as Lot 1MR, Block 12, Plan 172398, as shown in Attachment 1 of the April 22, 2024 Financial and Corporate Services Report, FCS 02391. Second. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Uh, seconded by Councillor Rice. Uh, please vote on the recommendation. We have all the votes. Display the vote. That is carried. Great. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So uh, moving on to our first item of the day, which would be uh, item 3.2, uh, Charter Bylaw 20766, to allow for larger scale parks and amenities, Edgemont, Rosenthal, and Glad Riding Heights. Um, I'm also just going to double check uh, with our, our speaker, I know they had a, a bit of a late registration. Uh, Brent, are you with us? I believe I'm live now, yes. Great, okay, perfect. Um, so we'll, uh, looks like we have the right delegation in front of us for administration, so we'll uh, turn it over for presentation. Thank you very much. I, I don't have a uh, formal presentation. My uh, question. Sorry, um, sorry. Apologies, Brent. We're, we're going to hear from uh, city administration first, and then um, we'll be going to speakers after that. No problem. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Uh, good morning. This application proposed to rezone three sites in Edgemont, Rosenthal, and Glen Ridding Heights from the neighborhood parks and services to the parks and services zones. The rezoning is necessary in order to have these properties correctly align with the joint use agreement, which at the time of the adoption of the new zoning bylaw was not up to date. It will also facilitate school and park development in accordance with the approved Edgemont, Rosenthal and Glen Ridding Heights plans for which the school board has advised that funding has been secured for design and or construction is imminent. Next slide, please. Each site is centrally located within each neighborhood and generally surrounded by existing and planned small-scale residential uses under the RSF zone. Next slide, please. The application aligns with the relevant goals and policies of the city plan, helping create equal opportunities for people to easily connect to open spaces and amenities that are accessible through the system of pathways. By contributing to the provision of parks and school sites in Edgemont, Rosenthal, and Glenridding Heights, it also facilitates the continued development of these neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Administration reached out using the city webpage and postcards sent to surrounding property owners and the presidents of the Edgemont, Greater Windermere, and Rosenthal Community Leagues, as well as the West Edmonton Communities Area Council. Three responses were received expressing opposition, feeling the existing PSN zoning would better serve the larger community by accommodating a, a community league building or a recreation center rather than a school. Next slide, please. Administration supports the application because it facilitates the preparation and future construction of the planned school sites, is compatible with surrounding and existing and planned land uses, conforms with the approved plans, 
and it aligns with the city plan by providing open space amenities in the forms of parks and schools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we do not have any speakers in favor for this item, but we do have uh, someone registered in opposition. Uh, so <clears throat> Brent, we will now uh, go to you to um, give your presentation or, or take your five minutes to speak rather. Um, and uh, yes, please know you, you do have five minutes to speak. You might wanna have a timer of your own, uh, but I will turn the floor over to you for your comments. Thank you very much. My comments and concerns are specific to the Glen Ridding subdivision. Um, I I live in that uh, in that neighborhood, backing onto that particular park, uh, and uh, do the regular school commute that many of us do uh, to get our children um, attending schools inside the Henday. My opposition to this surrounds the size of the school and the amount of students that would potentially attend, and I would like to see that there would be a little more. Um, potential uh, a study or something done to figure out what the community could actually handle for traffic in the mornings. Most mornings in the winter, uh, it's not uncommon to spend 20 minutes to get to the end day from that subdivision without a school actually in that subdivision. I would get concerned that if we rezone and allow for taller schools and larger structures, if that was the end result, that was that uh, we had an increased student count and we had larger schools than we currently have in the neighboring neighborhoods like the uh, Dr. Margaret Ann Armour, which would be the closest school. If we're getting into schools that size or larger, I'd be very concerned that the community of structure couldn't handle the traffic. That, that is all. Thank you, Brent. Um, I'll turn to colleagues if there's any questions of our speaker. Councillor Cartmel. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us today, sir. So um, maybe I'll just check in with you. Uh, it's my understanding that the size of the school intended for that uh, space is a K to six school. Do you, is that your understanding as well? Correct. Uh, and that would be, uh, as I understand it, a school of roughly 600 students. So it would be uh, I think a school closer to the size of uh, Joy Moss School, as an example, uh, as opposed to DMAA. Uh, do you share that understanding as well? I do. So your and I guess my con my understanding is that your concern is uh, traffic movements uh, within the neighborhood. Is can you be? Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Is uh, where do you find the conflict? Is it getting to Rabbit Hill Road or Ellerslie Road or 170th Street, or is it once you get to those roads, getting across the Hende? The backup would start at essentially the Hende and Rabbit Hill Road and everything that funnels um, either, you know, through Glen Ridding towards uh, Rabbit Hill Road in the Hende or the other way to go to Twilliger Drive and, uh, and, and Ellerslie to Exhill that way. Um, and, and backs up all the way into the subdivision currently um, beyond, you know, essentially where the entrances would be to, to access that school. And I believe the zoning change would actually allow for a taller, larger school. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Uh, th well, that's not my understanding, but I don't know what the height restriction would be, generally speaking, typically, um schools of that size are more or less single story buildings except for the utility core, right? The gymnasium and, and the like. Now I'm answering your questions and that's not the way it's supposed to work, but, uh, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask it in this way. Don't you think that the school might resemble uh, an elementary school in that way? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, sorry. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so um, maybe just to dig just a little bit deeper, would, uh, where do you think the pinch points are when it comes to uh, uh, vehicle movements? Is it the uh, Rabbit Hill Road and Ellerslie Road intersection uh, that backs up into the community? Uh, and, and on the other edge, the 170th Street, Windermere Boulevard intersection or farther south? I, I, I believe both of those would be the areas that are causing pinch points. Uh, basically where you go, as soon as we go down to two lanes in those areas, which 
you know, seems to be a common problem as we, you know, uh, the city sprawls and we expand out. When you go from, you know, four lanes down to two, that backs up all the way south down Rabbit Hill Road and the two lane direction on the Ellingsley Road backs up all the way, you know, uh, heading west towards where you would enter Ampleside to go to uh, the MAA. So are you aware um, that, um, like, those are arterial roads that you've mentioned in uh, those roads are the responsibility of local developers to build, and they typically build those out uh, as we get more rooftops, basically, as, as the neighborhoods fill in. Are you aware of that, that it's uh, essentially developer responsibility uh, to develop Correct. that road network? Yeah. So I guess, uh, you know, understanding your concerns are that the, the school might create a, uh, an activity point in the neighborhood that doesn't have immediate relief uh, would you agree that once the developers build out that road network, that uh, that concern is is reduced to some degree? I would agree, assuming the attendance stays in the numbers that you described earlier. Right. And, you know, part of attracting people to the neighbourhood uh, so that we get the rooftops that beget the road development includes having amenities to serve those people, things like schools. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, and then I, you know, we can talk offline. I'm happy to, to, uh, have a conversation with you about some of the other aspects of, uh, land development and, um, roadway development, uh, in your neighborhood that, uh, uh, create those pinch points. So, uh, if you're of a mind to, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. I would welcome that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Uh, so I'm not seeing anyone else on the board for questions or speakers. Um, so we'll now uh, turn back to administration to see if there are any questions. Councillor Wright. Thank you. I just um, have a couple of questions. In the report, it talks about the, the K-6 school in Glen Ridding. Is this also the site then for the, um, sorry, for the 7 to 12? This is the site for the K to six, Councillor Wright. Okay, um, Councillor, the uh, the high school, the seven to twelve, is in the district park in Glen Ridding. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought this is what we just approved for the district park area. No, okay. Not familiar with the area. Maybe I'll take a drive out there, Councillor Cartmel. <laughs> okay, um, that's. I just wanted clarity on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Um, so I'm not seeing any further questions on the board. Um, I will provide uh, just an opportunity for um, uh, any, any new information uh, that may have arisen during the public hearing. Not seeing anything. Uh, would someone like to move closure of the public hearing? I would like to move closure of the public hearing on item 3.2. Second. Second. Seconded by Councillor Knack, I believe. Uh, okay, um, please vote on closure of the public hearing. We have voted vote. Please display the vote. That is carried. Councillor Salvador, I'll move first reading of item 3.2 and speak to it briefly. Second. Moved by Councillor Cartmel, seconded by Councillor Knack. Um, and we'll just pause for a second if there's anyone else to speak before I go to Councillor Cartmel. Go ahead. Thank you. So uh, I really do appreciate the comments of uh, our speaker today. Uh, there continues to be challenges uh, on the road network. Uh, there's a number of things that contribute to that those challenges, uh, not the least of which is that there's simply not enough schools in the neighborhood to serve all the students there. So we have a lot of people making that journey every morning from their homes in uh, Ward Pahesuin to schools that are north of the Hende. Uh, there are some road projects that uh, might provide that relief. I won't bore you with those. Um, there are uh, some of those road projects that will allow us to provide much better transit service to that neighborhood, which will help uh, reduce some of the pressure on the road network. Uh, I know that there's uh, a lot of people in that corner of the city that are really looking forward to, uh, to having uh, that infrastructure. And I would note that there are some non-contributory landowners that uh, 
uh, are creating those those empty spaces uh, where the city has uh, effectively enveloped those spaces and passed them by. So it's hard to fill in all the spaces and it's hard to build all of the roads when uh, you don't own all of the land. Uh, and finally, I would note that, uh, you know, as, as arterial road uh, development and construction has evolved over the years, uh, these roads are entirely the uh, responsibility of our developer uh, industry and our developer partners. And, uh, you know, roads like Rabbit Hill Road, Ellerslie Road, uh, will be developed in the fullness of time as these neighborhoods fill in. And, uh, you know, it's a bit of a circular argument at times that uh, the road network doesn't uh, allow for all the people to get out of the neighborhood, but as we add things that allow them to stay in the neighborhood, we re both reduce the pressure on the roads and get enough development in the space to actually, uh, you know, build the road system out for those things I'm talking about, uh, not just for vehicles, uh, but for transit and uh, for um, multi-use trails that uh, are part of these roadway corridors that allow people to uh, move to and through the neighborhoods and the schools that we're talking about. I would note that this particular site is, is surrounded by development and has access with walking parts. It's a very walkable community and allows people to access that site, uh, not necessarily with a car, but uh, with a stroller or a bike or roller blades or all kinds of other things that uh, as the neighborhood develops out people would be thrilled to be able to go to the local school and uh, make their way there. Uh, and in the fullness of time, we'll have this school, hopefully, ideally. It's uh, in the planning stages, but just a uh, half mile to the south is the district park that will see that brand new, fully funded, to be constructed public uh, 7 to 12 high school. That's an exciting development. So leave it there. Seek my colleagues' support on this. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Kurtmel. Please vote on first reading. We have all the votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Councillor Salvador, I'll move second reading of item 3.2. Second. Please vote on second reading. We have all the votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Councillor Salvador, I'll move consideration of third reading of item 3.2. Second. Please vote for consideration. That is... We have a vote. <laughs> Thank you. Display the vote. That is carried. Councillor Salvador, I'll move third reading of Charter Bylaw 20766. Second. Please vote on uh, third and final reading. We have voted vote. Display the vote. That's carried. Great, thank you everyone. Uh, so we're gonna be moving on to item 3.9, Charter Bylaw 20A00 to allow for a medium scale housing Windsor Park. Um, so I know we have a number of speakers uh, for this item, uh, but first we will hear from administration. Good morning. Just wait for the presentation to tee up here. Okay, this application is to rezone three parcels in the Windsor Park neighborhood from the RS, small scale residential zone to the RM, medium rise residential zone with a height modifier of 23 meters or approximately six stories. Next slide, please. The properties front onto 116th Street, a collector road, and are walking distance to major institutional employment areas and two LRT stations. Next slide, please. The proposed RM zone allows for a building roughly six stories high and the zone's flexible regulations mean that different building designs are possible. The model on the slide shows a scenario where the building takes a U-shaped form. The image also models buildings in orange that show the expected scale of development in a major node. Allowing for a six-story building on this site anticipates the scale of future built form and allows an appropriate transition to existing small-scale buildings. 
There are regulations in the zone, like step backs above the four story and facade articulation that help mitigate the perception of building mass. Next slide, please. The city plan establishes a network of nodes and corridors where deliberate urban intensification will be supported. The site is within the University Garneau major node where mid and high rise developments can be supported. This application also aligns with the big city moves of rebuildable city and community of communities by allowing more people to live in the redeveloping area of Edmonton and making it easier to meet their daily needs. Next slide, please. Administration carried out a variety of act engagement activities for this application, with most feedback being in opposition, but some in support as well. The concerns we heard were largely centered on the application not aligning with land use plans, such as the draft district plans, and how deviation from these plans leads to a loss of public trust in communities, as well as overall concern for the potential size of the building. The support we heard related to the site being an excellent location for increased density given its proximity to the university, and that development will help with housing affordability and allow more people to live a lifestyle that is less car dependent. Administration recognizes that a building of this scale will have impacts, particularly on the abutting properties. The impacts are a trade-off to the benefits of enabling more people to live within walking distance of transit, amenities, and significant institutional employment centers. Next slide, please. In closing, administration supports this application. It is located within the University Garneau major node. It provides additional housing in proximity to major employment center that is well connected to transit and active travel modes. And it provides an appropriate transition from the larger building forms anticipated in the major node to the existing small scale and medium scale buildings. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that presentation and overview. Uh, so we'll now go to uh, speakers who are in favor. Um, so we will, I know we have a mix of folks who are um, both in person and remote. So I'm just gonna go through the entire list again, uh, just briefly, um, let me know that you're online. So Jacob DeWang. Hi. Uh, Marij Khan. Uh, so no Marij. Uh, Andrew Bembridge. Nope. Um, so Marcelo Figuera uh, in person and you can come down to the podium and the, the clerk will help you uh, to your spot. Okay, sure, that's, uh, that's fine. You can just arrange yourselves in the appropriate order. Um, so after uh, Marcelo, uh, that would be Jared. Um, as well as um, I see Mason is with us in chambers. Uh, Mark Huberman, you're online. I am online, thank you. Uh, Richie Lamb, are you with us? No, uh, and Elaine Solas. Um, and I see you're on for questions only. Okay, um, feel free to come down to, um, to the podium as well. Uh, and then if there's any questions, we'll be easily able to ask you them. Okay, so we will go to our first speaker, uh, Jacob, joining remote. Uh, you have five five minutes, please go ahead. Hi, I did uh, attach a presentation, if the clerks have it. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. My name is Jacob DeWong, um, and I'm gonna hear, speak in favor of this application. Uh, next slide, please. So first to set the scene, uh, as administration talked about, this site is very closely located to transit, jobs, and school. You can see it's a nine minute walk from the Health Sciences Jubilee stop. Um, also about nine minutes from the university stop. And of course, it's really right next door to the University of Alberta, um, as well as the major employment area at, at, uh, at the hospital. Next slide, please. And, you know, Yes, we do need more housing near the university. As the University of Alberta uh, looks to grow by thousands of students in the future, we can see that um, the population and dwelling growth in the university station area in the brown compared to Edmonton as a whole um, 
has really not kept up over the past 20 years. And when more people are looking to move to the university and as we need more, um, as we, uh, we, we will need more housing for the, for the students and the staff that will, will come here to support that, um, to support that growth. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, cool fact, I don't have this data myself, but we can actually go back to 1951, thanks to researchers at the University of Western Ontario. It's not quite the uh, Windsor Park area, but it's this, this area that encompasses sort of around the university. Uh, next slide, please. And using this data, we can see that the university area is actually less dense than 1951, um, probably due to changing household sizes. So you can see that we're, you know, over the past, was that 70 years, it's been more or less up and down, maybe 2021, that big drop is due to COVID probably. But um, we we do need more housing here for the for people to come um, to 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 respond to this increasing demand to live in this area. Um, next slide, please. So I think approving baby and I'm going to call this baby mid-rise housing because it's, you know, six stories is barely a mid-rise scale. It's really required to meet council's goals. So the first one being 50% of net new units through infill. We're, we're not quite there yet. And this is like the best location for infill um, because for the next goal, we want 50% of trips to be taken by active and public transit. If we're not adding infill like this here, right next to two stop, it's two stops on the LRT, right next to one of the biggest employers and um, trip attractors in the city, like where else should we be adding it? And the third one, less than thirty-five percent of household income spent on housing and transportation. We are experiencing growth like we haven't seen ever. Um, but I think um, Councillor Nack said that we added, what, a red deer in the past two years? This demand is not going to just magically disappear. People are looking to move here. When I looked to move here last year, um, I found that the rents in this area around the university um, were some of the highest in the city. Luckily, I can afford to live uh, in this area around the university, but not everyone can. And I think we should be striving to make sure that um, our neighborhoods are accessible, that we have a diversity of um, people and incomes that are able to afford these neighborhoods. Uh, next slide, please. And a bit of a postscript, um, under the draft district plans that were just updated, this would be a discretionary use. So although it is outside that border of the major node, it does fall within, um, next to within 100 meters of the node and corridor area. It is also along an arterial and collector roadway. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, I would make the argument that under the city plan, as Edmund said, this site is arguably in the major node. I would say that being so close to transit and this and the major employers, that this should probably be in the major node in district plans anyway. I think this should be a no-brainer to approve, and I hope that you do approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Marcelo Figuera, or you have a preferred order. So actually, we'll go to uh, Jared first. No, I got the order wrong. <laughs> a one in three chance. Um, <laughs> Mason? Yes, that's right. Great. <laughs> Please go much. ahead. You have five minutes. All right, good morning, Madam Chair and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. My name is Mason Vondrohi, and I'll be um, representing Green Space Alliance along with my colleagues today. My presentation illustrates how the development fits in with the surrounding context and complements the neighborhood. The immediate area surrounding the site was considered to better understand the suitability of the RM zone and development. Next slide, please. Windsor Park currently features predominantly small-scale residential development with some commercial and recent mid and high-rise development along 87th Avenue. This map illustrates the limited residential development density previously provided through infill and the lack of transition from the university. The darker yellow infill development scattered across the neighborhood represents other recent infill projects including skinny houses. While some multi-unit development is appearing along the southern edge of the neighborhood, the majority of the area is occupied by single detached dwellings. 
Looking at the map provided on screen, the existing land use and urban forms between the university and the neighborhood are starkly different. 116th Street's distinct east-west built form currently acts as an unwelcome dividing line between these urban forms. However, with appropriate transition and development, this divide can be reduced. This is discussed in my next slide. And next slide, please. Windsor Park's urban pattern comprises residential streets and a large central park. The built form in Windsor Park, west of 116th Street, comprises mainly of one to two story residential buildings. On the east side of 116th Street, existing university towers reach heights up to 14 stories. There is currently no physical transition between the university towers and the neighborhood across 116th Street. The built form of the neighborhood is out of scale with building types and heights on campus. Tower buildings along 87th Avenue, including the Bentley Tower, which is four stories, and Windsor Terrace Building, which is 11 stories, are beginning to establish transitions from the university into the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Recent scattered infill developments are in the form of traditional single detached houses, skinnies, and duplexes. However, these types of housing cannot address market demand, specifically for students and seniors. The proximity to the university creates demand for rental units in the Windsor Park neighborhood. The current urban form necessitates that this demand be directed towards single detached developments. However, this demand could be more efficiently met through higher density development. The total vacancy rate for apartment housing in the 2023 CMHC rental market survey for the university zone is 1.2%. This indicates that there is an urgent need for multi-unit housing in the area. The proposed RM zone is an efficient means of addressing the demand for the rental demographic for the area. The RM zone provides additional density and more efficient use of land, similar to developments which have been implemented along 87th Avenue. Next slide, please. Windsor Park is well connected to the emerging University of Garneau major node and citywide. 116th Street is an important arterial roadway that connects the neighborhood to the River Valley and the wider city. 87th Avenue is a major arterial that connects the Windsor Park neighborhood to the university area. Future residents of the proposed development will have access to a range of mobility choices, including mass transit, walking, and strolling. Access to mass transit bus services is available along 87th Avenue to the south and on the university campus to the east. The university and the Health Sciences Jubilee LRT stations are also within walking distance of the site. Painted bike lanes are located east of the subject site on 116th Street and in the form of shared use pathway cutting laterally east-west in Windsor Park. The site features monolith sidewalks and rolling curbs throughout. These sidewalks are well connected and feature at-grade crossings that are wheelchair friendly. Increased vehicular traffic will be easily accommodated in the grid pattern of streets and avenues surrounding the site. This concludes my presentation. My colleagues will now continue with the suitability of the RM zone and compliance with existing and proposed city policies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jared, please go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chair and Council. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My presentation is going to illustrate how we responded to public engagement feedback regarding why we think the RM23 zone is the best option for this site. In our opinion, the RM zone serves a balanced approach to intensification and accommodates higher density residential development that is compatible with and provides transitions from adjacent university buildings to the east. Next slide, please. Windsor Park is slowly transitioning from a single detached enclave to more equitable distribution of housing opportunities. Single detached houses account for almost 90% of the existing housing stock in Windsor Park, which is nearly double the city average. The loss of three single detached dwellings on this site will not materially impact the availability of single detached dwellings within the neighborhood. It will provide multi-unit housing that diversifies the neighborhood's housing stock and creates more equitable living opportunities for residents wanting to live in proximity to the university and mass transit. Such opportunities are currently limited in Windsor Park due to the lack of housing diversity. Next slide, please. <coughs> Respondents to City of Edmonton online engagement provided key comments that we responded to administration or the Windsor Park Community League. 
regarding vehicle parking comments, surface parking at the rear of the building typically reduces space needed to appropriately accommodate operational functions, including garbage collection and delivery space. Visitor parking will likely be provided underground with the option to create a separate resident only access area for tenant access and visitors. Safety within the underground parking will be addressed through a series of gates controlled by swipe cards whereby limiting access uh, providing to visitors. And regarding long and short term bicycle parking, parking spaces will be allocated in convenient and visible locations as per the new zoning bylaw regulations. Shortcutting has been addressed in our traffic impact assessment provided for this application and our transportation consult consultant Mark Huberman is here to provide any additional comments as council sees fit. Regarding the condition of the alleyway, it is anticipated that the alley will be upgraded to a commercial alley standard to accommodate increased traffic and servicing requirements. The length of this upgrade will be determined by city transportation at the development permit stage. Next slide, please. For some residents, the number of units is a potential concern. The University of Alberta intends to expand enrollment by 35% from 44,000 students to 50,000 students by 2026 and up to 60,000 students within the next decade. So this increased enrollment will increase housing demand that will need to be met by the market. The RM zone provides a framework for encouraging dwelling types that can accommodate multi-person households and leave the option of providing uh, a diversity of unit types in the neighborhood. Uh, Mayor Sohi noted as part of his announcement for the Canada Builds program that in the time of a housing emergency, it is students and seniors that need a greater supply of housing. And the proposed building provides housing that responds to this demand. Regarding comments about excessive building size, the proposed six-story building provides a reduced height and transition from university buildings immediately to the east across 116th Street. While a 23 meter height is the maximum height for this RM zone with the 23 meter height modifier, details related to wood construction standards and fire regulations suggest that a 20 meter building would likely be selected for the final design. And this is something that Westrich always plans and designs carefully to keep construction costs low. And finally, regarding the loss of family-oriented units, the trade-off between three single detached dwellings for multi-unit dwellings adjacent to the university is a compelling exchange to meet rental demands in the area. And small-scale infill housing will continue to be provided in the neighborhood's interior. This concludes my pres presentation. Thank you so much. And next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll now go to Speaker uh, Figuera. Good morning, Madam Chair and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. In this presentation, I would like to continue on the public engagement uh, topic because one of the most recurring uh, comments we heard was regarding compliance with the traffic district plan. The key question was, is this site inside or outside the University Garden or Node? To answer this question, we first need to remind ourselves that both the city plan and the traffic district plans indicate that future build form should be designed to provide transition with surrounding areas. Whether the site is within the node or not, we will only know for 100% when council gives three readings to the district plans, which will probably happen only in the fall. In the meantime, I would submit that answer this question is not critical to approve this rezoning. And let me explain. Uh, next slide, please. A few months ago, there was an application in McCurney across the park, and council heard many concerns about whether the site was inside or outside the 76 uh, Avenue corridor in the draft uh, Scona district plan. If memory serves me well, I believe there are some councillors, uh, maybe Councillor Nyko Stevenson, that raised a valid point for final draft district plans. Something around the lines of, let's ensure that the best planning practice we have been implementing for years are carried forward in these district plans. Well, the transition between built form is one of those best practices found in our neighborhoods. These diagrams show on the screen outline different errors in our planning process, but both emphasize 
the same idea of establishing a gradual building transition into single detached neighborhoods. This is carried forward in the, district, in the city plan and the district planning framework. This application reflects this practice. Next slide, please. Currently, there's no built form transition from the university's tall buildings across 160th uh, Street. The existing conditions is neither planned nor appropriate as conceptually shown in the bottom image on the screen. The IM zone contributes toward the transition approach shown in the top image, while this approach considers the built form of both sides of 116th Street, thus uh, tapering down the height toward the interior of the neighborhood. So high, high transitions are rather uh, are important, rather than uh, abrupt shifts in scale, creating uh, visual uh, skyline, playing a, a critical role in sunlight exposures, and helping to preserve neighborhood character. This approach promotes this balance of mixed use building size, contributing to a more diverse and vibrant street. In this case, planning is just reflecting common sense as how uh, small scale, low-rise and mid-rise developments can coexist and contribute to a strong diverse of housing stock and build for. Next slide, please. But being so close to the public hearing date for the district plan, is it reasonable to wonder if this application complies with the plans or not? Unless significant changes arise from the public hearing in May, this is a straightforward yes. And by significant changes, I mean, for instance, not allowing mid-rise buildings on collector roads outside the nodes and corridors, which would deeply affect the city uh, as a whole. Draft existing plan policy reproduced in this slide on the screen clearly support intensification and transitions between built forms rather than a sharp divide. Next slide, please. To conclude, this application not only aligns with the direction of the city plan and the draft of the district plans, but represents an appropriate direction for the intensification in Windsor Park. The lay on application that aligns with the draft of district plan in this final stage would be unfair treatment given similar application were allowed to move forward. Timely decision making demonstrates res responsiveness to Edmonton's needs and priorities, facilitating efficient implementation of the city's vision and maintaining public and industry trust in the planning process. Approving this application would not only signal confidence in the proposed plans, but also foster consistency and predictability in the development process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'll go to speaker, um, actually, uh, the remaining speakers are just to answer questions only. Uh, so we'll now turn to the board to see if there's any questions from colleagues. Councillor Knack? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm happy to defer to the ward councillor if you want to go first. Chair Salvador, may you confirm that um, Speaker Andrew uh, Benbridge um, is, isn't available? Oh, sure. Um, yes, Speaker uh, Andrew Benbridge, are you online now? Oh, not, uh, not hearing anything. And I'll also uh, just double check with um, Marij Khan to see if you're online. No. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Nack. Okay, sure. Uh, thank you, Councillor Salvador. Um, thanks, everyone, for your comments. Uh, I actually would love to ask uh, Ms. Solis questions. I, I'm, I, I, it's, I, I don't know what to do when you don't speak, uh, so I feel like I have to <laughs> ask you about this. Um, I'd love to get a bit more insight from you. I know you've been to our public hearings over the, <laughs> over the years, and some of them you've supported, some you haven't. It says here you've registered in favor, but I, I, I haven't received anything written. So do you want to just give us the Coles Notes version of, of why you are in support? Uh, well, first of all, I want to clarify that the Community League is neutral. This is the oh, you're here on behalf of the Community League. This is the League. second time we've been neutral, so uh, on, a, on a rezoning. Yes, you, um, yeah, my gray hair belies the fact that I've, I've been here a few times. Um, but yeah, so it, it is uh, neutral. So what, uh, so uh, did you have another question? Oh, sure. Yeah. So at first, I think you've just answered. You're actually here on behalf of the Community League. Is that what I've heard? That's correct. And I oh. did send a written submission on Friday that you would have received. Oh, I apparently think. I didn't. So I will track that down. That might have explained why I've, I've missed that. So, um, well, then for, for those of us, which might just be me, who, who don't have what was sent on Friday, do you want to give me a, a quick version of what, what uh, the Community League sort of provided in terms of their neutral opinion on this? Okay, um, 
We decided to remain neutral shortly after this. Uh, we received notice that there was a rezoning application, uh, and that uh, occurred. We received notice in August, and we made the decision to remain neutral in September. And the date uh, and the timing is important here because we had just uh, been to council, well, a year ago now, but at that time, just a few months ago, um, a, a few months previous, in opposition of a large um, six-story development in the interior of the neighborhood on a local road. Uh, and we thought we had made, uh, well, the best presentation we could on why um, it wasn't appropriate in that location. And council, in its wisdom, um, did approve it. So we didn't see um, when, a, when an application came in that was half the size on a collector road on the edge of the neighborhood, um, we didn't see how an opposition, our opposition could be successful. So we decided to remain neutral because we do have limited volunteer resources and wanted to spend our uh, efforts on other things at that time. Uh, and then of course, when the uh, time came around to, uh, when the uh, materials were ready for public engagement uh, earlier this this year. Uh, we retained uh, we did retain our, our neutral position, but we provided some comments uh, to administration and the developer, uh, some of which have already been addressed, and some will continue. Our you know it's our understanding will continue to be considered uh, as this uh, moves forward if it is approved. Uh, so that that's in the nutshell of uh, what we did. That's helpful. And I, I just got a copy of it now. So thank you. I'm just uh, I'll, I'll double check as we're going through some other questions. Um, I, I, maybe the other question. And I, so I'm hearing what you're saying is just you're trying to prioritize what you what you work on in your in, in everyone's limited volunteer time. Um, so I, I would be curious. So you, the way you described it is is maybe I'm reading into it, so I'd like to just more ask it directly. Is that was there a desire to register or to to be in opposition, but you felt that it's just it wasn't going to be a good use of your time, or or is it in fact you see pros? And, is there is it in fact a truly neutral position that you see pros and cons, and and due to that you felt that the right approach is is to be neutral. Uh, kind of a, a bit of both. We know okay. there's opposition in the community and we knew that without having to do any kind of formal survey. Uh, there um, people uh, in, on the executive when we made this uh, decision, you know, nobody was thrilled uh, about this, uh, but we are realistic um, uh, about, you know, the the changes that are that are happening and the um, the way things are unfolding and the you know being near a major node like we are, um, so it's it was mainly the um, you know the use of our resources and the fact that we know there's going to be uh, some increased density in the area and we have we've been on public record in the past as saying that it's more appropriate at the edges of the neighborhood and on the arterial roads. And uh, so far, except for the one from last, uh, a year ago, so far that has been the case. Okay, I'm out of time. I might come back around, but thank you. That's helpful, appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I think, um, <clears throat> Mason, you talked about it being the sort of a transitional area, excuse me. <clears throat> so it's not only, <clears throat> It provides that. I'm trying to get my bearings as far as north, south, east, and west here with all the different um, perspectives that are provided. So it's not only a transitional area, I think going to the south um, and, and into some of the areas that are, that are more the single family, but it's also transitional then to the east. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, okay, okay. So it, it sort of serves a whole bunch of different purposes. Okay, great. Um, and Jared, you had, um, your pr presentation included um, the um, 
the garbage area and delivery area. Um, is that garbage area going to be sufficient to accommodate the multi-stream collection? It will be planned, so yes. Okay, and adequate turning areas and everything like that. Okay, awesome. And um, you also mentioned about um, um, student families. There's, or you mentioned about students as being, or students and seniors were the, the high, um, the higher requirement, right? Thank you for Where the question. Is? I would reference that the uh, proposed development aligns for both those uh, demographics uh, and it tries to accommodate that demand. Okay, and there, there will, there is going to be larger units. Not, they're not, they're not all studio or one bedroom, right? There will be a variety of units. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Thank you. Uh, apologies, I'm a little ill today. Um, uh, for Ms. Sol, as I just wanted to confirm, so um, you, one of your pieces of feedback was about the alleyway. Um, you wanted the alleyway to go tip to tail, 87 to 89, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay, and as I understand it, admin said they would they be reviewing that, so I'll, I can ask them around the next round. You also were concerned about the parkade and visitor access. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, yes, initially, um, when we read the um, transportation study, uh, it indicated that visitor parking and bicycle parking would be in the underground parkade. And to us, that meant that um, the parkade would be open to anybody walking, biking, or driving up to it, you know, it would open. Um, and uh, we did have further conversation with the developer um, after the submission date. We tried to connect beforehand, but the scheduling uh, didn't work. And after the submission date, we learned, you know, those of us who, you know, live in single detached houses don't, <laughs> don't know these things necessarily, that there would be a uh, a secure way for visitors to drive into the parkade uh, by, you know, buzzing the, the people they're visiting and being um, then uh, remotely, uh, the door would open remotely for them and not for anybody that, that drives up. So we're, um, so that took care of our concern about that and also our, cons our suggestion about some design changes to accommodate surface visitor parking. And we also learned that the bike parking would be in the front and not in the parkade. The, vi not the visitor bike parking, not the, uh, the, uh, the, the resident would be underground. I mean, obviously, I'd urge the proprietor to put some safe, secure bark bike parking in a cage in the parkade uh, um, for the residents. That would just improve the safety and security and saleability of the project. But yeah, uh, duly noted for the guests that they can, they can park and lock up up front. Um, I just wanted to understand your concern around shortcutting a bit better. Uh, well, there's going to be a lot of traffic generated from this development. Um, 500 vehicular trips a day uh, was the estimate. Um, and one of the exit uh, avenues, 89th Avenue, is one way eastbound. So we anticipate some you know, maneuvering through the neighborhood on other streets uh, to get uh, to other directions. Okay. Well, that's part of a bigger Vision Zero conversation I think we need to have about doing a street lab and um, working on some of the traffic issues in the neighborhood. Um, and then I noted you had a couple other um, traffic concerns and then the, the topics of the height in the units. So that's, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's helpful. Did, was there anything else you wanted to add to your submission for my colleagues who may not have had a chance to read it? Uh, uh, no, th those uh, covered it. They, they were um, summarized in the report, in the admin report, and that's why I wanted to sign up to answer questions because it looked like in the report we were still asking for things that we now are not asking for. Okay. All right, that's that's helpful clarity then. Um, can I ask Mr. Uh, DeWang, um, on your chart, you showed a walk path to the Health Sciences LRT station. Why did you choose that and not the U of A LRT? Are you concerned about, like in, in my mind, when I when I lived in Lister Hall, we always walked to the 
well, I guess that's not true. Health Sciences was closer. Is it? Is it just proximity or? Uh, to be honest, it was really just random. They were both about the same distance, so I, I just chose one at random. Okay. It's probably the last one I looked up. Okay, it's not reflective of some other concern you have with safe crossing of the street or something. Uh, no, to be honest, um, okay. just to it's just to show that this site is um, well located next to the transit stations. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Uh, I'll yield my time. Would you like to move a second round, Councillor Jans? So moved. Second. Please vote on a second round. Councillor Prince pays a yes. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'm yes. Thank you, Councillor Rice. We have a vote. Display the vote. That's carried. Go ahead, Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, and, and sorry, Ms. Solis. A few more questions. Now that I've had a chance to hear all the questions and, and see what was shared, I, um, one thing you were touching on right at the end that I didn't get to follow up on as we ran out of time, um, just about that notion of, of how you envision the neighborhood to change. And, and so, you know, I, I heard from you and I, and I have heard over the years that generally speaking, and I mean, I get there's going to be people who don't want to see any change. I think there's some who, who are, you know, sort of grudgingly <laughs> willing to accept change. Um, from your perspective, I guess I want to just double check on that point around where you think change would be most appropriate in, in Windsor Park. And so what I heard from you just before we finished was along the arterial roads, along the collector roads, um, that's generally what we've been doing across the city for decades. Is is there? Can you dig in or share a little bit more detail about why why a site like this, even if not everyone might love it, why you think this might be a more appropriate site than say anywhere else in the neighborhood? I'm sorry, to, that's you to you, Ms. Solas. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I thought you were asking one of the. Uh... No, no, I, oh, how I, do, uh, okay. to them. I, I talk to them. I, I'd rather talk to you. We don't get oh, to talk. Okay. Very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, that's fine. How do, so the question is, how do we see change happening? Yeah. I mean, you, it seemed like you suggested that you felt that as a community overall, there's an understanding that the arterial roads and collector roads might be the most appropriate spots. I wanted to just better understand why. I mean, this is obviously a collector road, you know, this is what we do in a lot of neighborhoods, but but why is this something that I think, even if residents don't love it or, or the board didn't love it, that you felt like it, it might be appropriate? Um, I think it's because it is the general, the general uh, way things have been done or evolved and reflect policies, you know, longstanding policies like the residential infill guidelines, which have been, um, incorporated to a certain extent into the draft district plans. We would really like to see the four story, uh, you know, the, the urban mix uh, and the four story um, uh, configuration um, more than we are seeing. You know, it, it seems, you know, we got the Bentley, which was four stories uh, back in the day, uh, but everything since has been higher. Uh, <laughs> except for the, the one um, nice little three-story walk-up uh, that we have on one, uh, one corner um, of the arterial road and the collector road. We don't like the fact that it's a dedicated Airbnb hotel, but we do like the, uh, the built form of it. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think there's a motion coming tomorrow that have some chats about uh, Airbnb. Um, Th that's helpful. And so I guess maybe the, the last question I would ask, because I, you know, and I'll, I'll likely ask some questions of those registered in opposition, but, you know, appreciating it, and I do think that stat is important about, you know, Windsor Park has a significantly higher percentage of single family homes than, than I would even say a lot of mature neighborhoods. Um, I think it was about 87% right now. Um, it, if not on our, on our arterial road, if not on a collector road, would there be other places that would be more suitable for um, development like this in the community? At my, like my guess, especially based off the conversation around the, the most recent one across from Windsor Park School is that my feeling from residents is that they would be less inclined to be supportive of things more interior to the community, whereas having it on the exterior might 
provide more comfort. Is is that your feeling, or is there a place that that we're missing that we should be considering that's that's not sort of on the list right now? Uh, well, first of all, our neighborhood is quite small. I think you saw the, Absolutely. the outline yeah. of it. And uh, for for a six story, no, there aren't um, uh, the arterial road. Um, uh, are the mo are the most suitable? Uh, we would uh, think if it you know if it comes to that, uh, but our preference is for the four story urban mix as the as is um, outlined in the district plan, the draft dis district plans which aren't um, you know aren't in effect yet, uh, of course. Um, but in terms of densification throughout the neighborhood, we are seeing that, uh, mm -hmm. but not you know obviously not six stories, and we're expecting more of the three-story um, form and a more multifamily three-story. Uh, we're seeing, you know, of course, we're seeing this, the skinnies and the skinnies with secondary suites and uh, garden suites or backyard housing. We expect to see um, other things uh, coming up. We've got a corner row house, finally got a corner row house application, and there are a few more um, corner sites that have been um, sold recently and are getting ready um, for redevelopment. So we expect to see that, which we think is appropriate. Uh, so we are densifying. It's it's just you don't see it the way you do when you see one one great big thing like, like appreciate, this. Appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Sol. I'm out of time, but I always appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Um, okay, so uh, it looks like we have concluded questions uh, from those who are in favor. So we'll now move on uh, to speakers in opposition. Uh, so those who are joining us in person, uh, we can have you step back and we'll invite those um, who are joining. Well, I don't think we have anyone actually in person. Everyone's remote in opposition. Um, but I do want to check in here. We have a, a late registration, I believe. Um, is it Danica Walco? Do you look right? Uh, Danica, are you with us online? I am. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to double check that uh, speakers are in attendance, starting with Joe Miller. I am, thank you. Karen Hughes? Yes. Uh, Devin Beggs? Thank you. Here. Great. Julia Parker? Yes. Great, and uh, Danica's here. Okay, so we'll go to Joe uh, Miller first, and you have five minutes. Please go ahead. And I should have a PowerPoint. Oh, there we are. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk today about the uh, transition fallacy that I see in relation to this particular rezoning. And this is um, one of the topics that I addressed in written submissions that I sent in Friday that I hope were circulated to, uh, to everyone. I want to follow up on uh, a comment that Elaine made in relation to uh, community acceptance of a four-story building on a uh, collector road like 116. So from my point of view, it's not a matter of do we densify or do we not densify. It's an issue basically of do we do a four-story building or do we do a six-story building. Next slide, please. So from my point of view, it's a matter of uh, degree and reasonableness in relation to increasing density. A fourth story building as anticipated by the district policy would significantly increase densification. And the question then becomes, does a 23 or even 20 meter six floor building, does that transition in height, scale or mass into adjacent development? Next slide, please. This is uh, from the city production. This is the proposed building. And you can see to the left, which is to uh, east across 116th Street, that what we're dealing there basically is vacant land. Historically, uh, that was a Golden Bear football field. Next slide, please. Now it is a surface basketball courts to the further south. It's a parking lot. The reality is there's no buildings at all east across 116th Street to the rezoning strip. Next slide, slide, please. This is a current picture. So basically we're at the rezoning site. We're looking east across 116th Street and there are no buildings there. You can probably see the uh, distant Claire Drake Arena and you can see the basketball courts. 
Next slide, please. The city administration made an assumption. They said it's reasonable to assume that redevelopment of this land will occur in the next 10 years. Next slide. The question is, is that a reasonable assumption? Well, the reality is that this land has not been developed for decades. There's been no pronouncement from the university on development of the land. And there's no, even if there is the development, there's no indication of the size of the development. And the reality is whether it's developed or not is not a city decision, it's a university decision. The city administration advised me that they did not even ask the university about any specific development plans before they made their assumption. Their assumption is pure unfounded speculation. Next slide, please. So that's the east west. Here we have the north south. So you look in front of the building, that's where a new fourplex is going. And we want to carefully consider whether there, in fact, is a transition in size, height, scale, massing from the fourplex to the blue building south of it. Next slide, please. This gives a bit better view. You can see uh, kind of at the bottom of the page the, the uh, fourplex that's going in. And to the left, on the other side to the south, are two single family homes. So to deal with the fallacy, east to west, we have vacant university land that's undeveloped. We cross 116th Street, we hit this six floor, 23 meter apartment. And then as we continue further east, we're dealing with single family homes. North south, we have a fourplex, then the six story building, and then three single family homes. This next slide, please. In my submissions, this is not a proper balance of the increasing density and minimizing the impact on neighboring properties, which a forced unit building or four story building would uh, as opposed to a six story building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to speaker Karen Hughes. You have five minutes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I'm a member of uh, the Windsor Park Citizens Coalition as well, and I fully support the position that's just been outlined by Joe Miller. Um, I've also views on this development in the meeting materials, but I want additional points to what I've covered there and respond in particular to what I believe is a misleading picture that they provided by city planning on the issue of transitions, which Joe Miller has just discussed and also the Windsor Park Community Leagues of, of taking a position of neutrality. I uh, just, just my, my main view on this, I fully support uh, densification of the city as outlined in the city plan. I've read the city plan many times. I agree with if you especially thought of nodes and years. I believe that city planning has really taken us away from the original tent of the city plan. We, node is intended to be based in Arno where there's access to amenities. I believe that a four-story set of buildings on 116th is completely appropriate, but I do not see why the city uh, planning department is a position of um, moving to additional stories on uh, this particular site. Uh, Claire had in planning had mentioned that there are costs and benefits. There are benefits certainly because we can bring people into the neighborhood and I fully support that. I teach at the university. I know that students would like access. So would not academic staff and faculty members. But they're all the costs are basically the same as we discussed on the 118th West Church development uh, last year. They include increased traffic in the neighborhood and especially 116th, which is a major road into the community and is exceptionally high pace development intensified, especially for residents between 116th and 118th Street and ongoing safety concerns around the school given increased shortcutting and so on as the Windsor Park League has itself acknowledged. I want to add at what we heard in the what we heard report, we substantial opposition to zoning 
is the balance, the factor of the ratio of opposition is over three to one, despite the fact that the comments section was by pro-development individual on the neighborhood. So my question is again for planning, how are you balancing community input with developers' interests? To state the obvious, the city has already upzoned the entire city by 800%. We can now put eight units on a site. That will happen in Windsor Park to Andrew Nack's question. There's going to be development all over the place in our neighborhood. We fully support it. We support the original city plan, which was an urban mix. Another point is in relation to community league's position of neutrality. I will note the mission, which is in your materials, out, it basically echoes all of the concerns that many of us have about this development. So why are they taking a neutral stand? They do not represent my views. They do not represent the views of anyone I know in the community. And as far as I know, made no attempt to survey public opinion in the neighbor. My final point concerns this planning argument uh, six-story height, which is reasonable. And we heard this echoed by people speaking in uh, favor of the development. Uh, the, the logic is that it blends and transitions to buildings that will be built. Uh, planning has shown physical renderings. I would have liked to have gone back to that slide, but I didn't have time to prepare slides. I'm too busy teaching and marking exams. I will point out that on page 155, city planning also argues that perspective is quote unquote future focused and quote unquote reasonable to assume redevelopment of the lands. To be clear, these are not reasonable assumptions. They're completely at odds with the University of Alberta's Integrate Asset Management document, which was issued in January 2024, which essentially confirms a moratorium on major project plans over the ne next 10 years, 2023-24. In the plan, states that, quote, in the context of limited funding, where funds need to be stretched as far as possible, and I quote, the priority across all campuses is on the renewal and refurbishment of existing buildings with very limited consideration for facility expansion or construction. I've also talked for the last two weeks to senior people who are involved in the following functions, long-term planning, facilities and operation, and asset management. None of them are aware of things that the planning department has actually on its slides for this presentation. To verify their assumptions lack evidence and they contradict the public university strategic plan that is available for anybody to access. Why planning would present a view like this is beyond me. I'm happy to address other questions on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll now go to Speaker Devin Biggs. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. My name is Devin Beggs, and I am here speaking today in opposition to this proposed upzoning. The current attitude of developers and landowners is that if they build something like this and units aren't sold or rented long term, they can simply be converted into short term, into full time short term rentals. This is one of the major factors in our current housing crisis, since it encourages speculation and reduces affordable rental stock. This is also why I do not believe that the city's strategy of cutting red tape for developers makes sense as they are collectively responsible for the situation we find ourselves in. For example, I would like to direct your attention to that building in Windsor Park called Bentley in Prestigious. It's on 117th Street and 87th Avenue. This luxury condo building, described as combining European elegance with contemporary design and superior quality finishes, is a multi-award winning building and apparently a great place to live and a great investment. Believe it or not, these are not affordable units. They are full-time Airbnbs. So what guarantee is there that the units in this proposed development will be affordable? Approving exceptions like this one will not solve the housing crisis and will not bring rents down or prices down in the area. It will simply put more money into the pockets of developers who continue to spend large amounts of money on lobbying council for changes like this one. If council is serious about doing something about unaffordable rents and high housing prices, they will ban short-term rentals before they start considering upzoning for developers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to speaker Julia Parker. 
thank you. Um, I would like to comment on uh, some of the points raised by Joe Miller. I, I do live in the neighborhood. I'm not uh, directly affected by this development. I don't live uh, directly behind it, but I am on 116th Street uh, virtually every day. So I know I know the uh, that part of Windsor Park very well. I um, agree and, and want to emphasize the points that um, Joe Miller made about the uh, concept of transition, given the reality of that area. As, as uh, was pointed out, there, the university lands across from the site are vacant. There is no construction there at all. Um, hasn't been for as far as I've know, you know, for as far as I've been in Edmonton, which has been over 30 years. Um, the closest university building, which is kitty corner to the site, actually, um, it's the human ecology building, is three and a half stories high. So if we're talking about, you know, walking uh, on 116th across from the site, but along the campus, there's the vacant land and then there's a three and a half story um, human ecology building. And, you know, those are the, the university properties uh, to which this site relates. So uh, when we talk about transition, what we're really talking about as far as citizens of Windsor Park are concerned is transition into the neighborhood and into a neighborhood that is um, single family dwellings. It's one and two story dwellings. There are skinny homes coming in, in, in into the area. There are laneway um, units coming in to encourage densification. Uh, we've heard about some rural housing. This is all relatively small scale, which is in line with the character and nature of Windsor Park and allows Windsor Park to preserve those very features, the treed streets, the sense of, 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 of quiet and peace in, in, a, in a neighborhood adjacent to the university. It's a historic neighborhood. Um, those elements can be preserved with development that is at a scale that respects the current and historic scale of that neighborhood. So um, recognizing the importance of densification to the city um, and, and, and acknowledging the principle of transition, which is we've heard spoken about throughout uh, today's comments, um, from those both supporting and, and, and those opposing the uh, uh, the development. Um, I personally would would be in favor of a four story development if if uh, we are going to uh, look at densification on that site, because I think four stories is more in line with uh, transition into the adjacent built environment. The adjacent built environment is the environment of Windsor Park. It is not an environment across the way onto the campus because there is no built environment on the campus across from the site. So um, those are my comments and uh, thank you for your time and for the opportunity. Great, thank you so much. Um, now we'll go to speaker Danica uh, Walco. Hello. Hello, go ahead, you have five minutes. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I just wanted to emphasize that the Community League's neutrality does not represent my opinion and doesn't represent a good number, well, a majority, I would say, of the residents in Windsor Park. Um, my concern is that jumping to six floors from four floors is, is, really, is really premature. Um, four floors do it, densify. I don't think anybody is... It doesn't want densification, but we need it uh, to do it in a measured manner. And we need to evaluate uh, the impact that it has on the area and specifically on traffic and safety. I don't know if any of the councillors have been to this neighborhood or tried to get in and out of this neighborhood during rush hours. It is really, really difficult. And um, an earlier uh, presentation mentioned that they're calculating 500 vehicles per day with uh, six floor development. Is that correct? 
No reply. Okay. <laughs> well, 500 vehicles per day in this neighborhood on 116th and on 87th is going to be really, really challenging. And there are a number of properties along 116th that are for sale and sold. And if they all become four-story developments, I think that's going to be very challenging for people who live in Windsor Park to try to get to the university campus. Right now, it is not very safe. Uh, my husband crosses 116th daily many times, and he crosses at a crosswalk without any lights, and he regularly gets his heels almost clipped. So we're talking about densifying, that's going to increase. And that's going to put a lot of, um, a lot of pressure on our infrastructure. Thank you, that's all I have to say. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so we'll now go to questions of our speakers in opposition. Councillor Jans, would you like to start? Thank you to Mr. Miller. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, you were looking across the street at that parking lot and that, uh, track because I, uh, I for years have wondered the same thing. I mean, it's, uh, it blows my mind with all the land the U of A has that um, they haven't chosen to do a higher and better use development on that, um, on that parking lot beside the Butterdome. And I wanted to ask you, had you heard anything about future intention from the U of A on that space? Uh, I haven't. I think uh, Karen Hughes commented uh, on it. Um, I'm, so I haven't. I haven't heard anything. I I, uh, I I wonder about the term "better use" in the context of there being uh, sports facilities available. Uh, maybe that's a matter of debate. What do you, could you elaborate? Well, there's uh, there was a football field there for years. Uh, there's now basketball courts. Uh, I, I was thinking of the parking lot on the corner. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah, like, and uh, I mean, there's no shortage of parkades, just uh, two or three up the street on 116, two or three over by the Jubilee in the hospital. Um, it's uh, one by education, just one block north. It's, it's quite a few. Uh, it's funny, I actually have a draft of a blog post written about challenging the U of A to, you know, if you're planning on increasing from 44,000 to 60,000 students, how can you use your own land to help play a part in the housing crisis and the staffing crisis and ensuring that all students, staff and families are, are accommodated? So I guess my question is, if, if, this, if this sort of a development was on the other side of 116th Street, on the east side, say, for instance, on that Butterdome parking lot, um, would you be more amenable to welcoming it into the community? Well, if it was on the Butterdome parking lot, it wouldn't be in the community. Um, so that's that's one concern. But it's, I mean, these are hypotheticals. It, it's not. It's um, there's no development on the university lands. There hasn't been for decades. They've decided to put a parking lot there and a basketball court. There's no indication I'm aware of that they're going to uh, do anything different. And the city has no real control over what they do that is very true we don't um i guess what i'm what i'm just trying to understand is are are the concerns raised if whether this 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 story this building was on the east side or the west side of 116th street what is the what is the the difference to you well i, I think one difference is i have no say and the city has no say the university can do whatever they want uh but if there was uh you know, a, a large uh, six floor building on the east side of 116th. Um, you know, I might not be terribly happy about it, but I would know there's nothing I can do about it. So. Okay. Um, I mean, just south of 87, just on the other corner, we have some 12 story buildings. Um, I know they put up a new residence building lately too, had the community league. Did they have feedback on those projects? I don't, you might, right yeah. Sorry, you might have to ask uh, Elaine Solas about that. Uh, yeah, I'll go to our historian next. Yeah. Um, okay. 
so the if I can summarize, then the concern is that, and it, I'm just paraphrasing, so correct me if I'm wrong, it is on the west side of 116. It is in the community, and therefore more worried about the the um, the effects on the directly on the community rather than if it was on the east side. Is that is that correct? Well, I think that's right. And I, you know, our, the district policy, for example, the draft district policy talks about uh, a four story building on a collector road, which is what we have here. So I think the if it was a four-story building on the proposed rezoning site, I think you'd get much more better buy-in from the community. If it was on the other side of 116th Street, I think the recognition would be uh, we have no say in it, whether we like it or not. We have no say in it. Okay, I know. I know Windsor Park had a lot of feedback about the row houses or the ring houses when the U of A was talking about demolishing or moving them or whatever whatever the um the piece was so I, i'll ask i'll ask the u of a next time i talk with them what what their plan would be for community engagement there but i'm sorry i'm out of time i'll i would i hope my colleague will connect about the uh district planning piece thank you councillor jans uh councillor knack uh, thanks, Councillor Salvador, uh, and thank you all again for for taking the time to be here today, um, Mr. Miller. I'll continue with you and appreciate your your message um, uh, last week or whenever you sent it. Time is a blur. Uh, I wanted to just check in a little more. So, you know, I think uh, up until a few years ago, part of why um, I think four stories was only ever being talked about is because generally through the building code code you can only do four story wood frames and and then uh, as that changed provincially that started to change the conversation about about the the notion of of maybe making it easier to do six story uh, buildings um i heard a lot today from all, almost all the speakers in opposition general acceptance of that that notion of a four story including in your presentation and, and the rationale why um I think the piece I wanted to just get a better sense of is is for you. What what do you see is sort of the so some of the biggest differences when you start moving into that six story? Do you find that there's sort of a, a fundamental shift in terms of how that integrates with the community? Is 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 it or is it primarily because of the transition piece that you talked about in your presentation? I think for me personally. Um, it's probably both, but um, with the limited five minutes, I, did, I chose to do the uh, transitional part. And I just look at the picture that was put in the city administration and ask myself, does this really re represent transition in height, scale, or massing between a, uh, a fourplex on one side and uh, two single family homes, skinny homes on the other? And it just, it doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a matter of degree. Uh, yeah. And a four story has less effect on height, scale, and massing than a six story. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay. And, and, and I ask because I'm this is I think part of what we're grappling with now. We're, we're we exist in a in a new world where that type of product is more um seen as easier to build than it has been for, for many decades before. And so now it is coming up to, so we're seeing more of that being applied for in that conversation around, is this is this a substantial change? And then also, you know, that transition over the course of many decades, because I think part of the other challenges, you know, I, I live in the community I live in right now, we only have three story buildings. We haven't seen anything more. Um, you know, the building that I live in was, was tried to be rezoned for four and over time it changed to three story. And, and it was seen as a pretty big transition. And now I wonder if the properties next door to my building came forward, would, would six stories be seen as, um, as big of a leap now, being that we've had a three story building right beside it for, you know, almost 20, well, I guess 15 years now. And, and so I guess that's part of what I'm wondering about too, is that you're right. I think today it would be a pretty major difference compared to what's there right now, what's surrounding it what about over the next 50 years and if there was other development do you do you see a scenario where if that was allowed that you might start seeing other development that is more along that same scale slightly less um and, and therefore doesn't necessarily have that same impact as it would today when it's built and, and i appreciate that's hard because that means we're putting the onus on those who are living there today versus the ones who are being who will be there 50 years from now well, I think the, the answer, and in this case, is site-specific. So in this yeah. particular site, 
the fourplex that's depicted on the uh, diagram isn't built yet. Yeah. It's going to be brand new. And so that's the building to the north. The buildings to the south, there's two skinny homes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying they're brand new, but I'll say they're, they're pretty new in the yeah. last 10 years. Yeah. So I don't know what the lifetime of a home or a fourplex is, but let's assume it's, well, my house was built in, you know, 1918. So maybe uh, for the next 100 years, yeah. uh, that's what the transition is going to be. Okay. And that's and that's part of how, how we're looking at it there. Okay, Th that's really helpful. I appreciate you you sharing that. I think those are all my questions. Uh, thanks, Councillor Salvador. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, so I'm not seeing any further questions uh, from speakers, so we'll move to questions of administration. Councillor Knack. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Salvador. Uh, I feel like I'm having deja vu on public hearings over the last three months. <laughs> um, I do, and, and I, I appreciate we're also going to hear that we should give you know limited weight to the district plans as we've as we discussed even at the last public hearing. Um, I wanted to ask about this this notion of transition, about the location, about the current drafts and and that idea because I, I i do again i'm for some of the same reasons i've shared the last couple of meetings i'm worried that our plans even in draft four form are saying one thing and then we're having proposals that are saying another and creating this scenario where we have um well challenging discussions here and 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 I again appreciate that our plans can't be 100 percent that there's no there's no plan that can be set in stone you have to allow for evolution or adjustments but wanted to just find out from you again you know draft plans are saying four stories here we're saying six stories can you dig into why we're saying yes even though we've got some draft plans that are suggesting we would probably support something smaller Councillor Knack, uh, the district plans have a policy that is quite clear uh, to support development at the edges of nodes and corridors that provides a transition to the scale of surrounding development. So while there is a line on 116th Street and the urban mix is on the east side, uh, there's also a layered policy in there that it is an edge of a major node. That is the support that is quite clear to us in the district plans that we're using as a part of our rationale for supporting this application. Uh, I think it is a fair question that was raised around um, neighboring properties and maybe because they're f newly redeveloped, that's we, we don't have the same perspective. I, I, I think about, oh gosh, probably seven or eight years ago, uh, a rezoning application that's uh, for a new building that would have essentially left a single single family home between two apartment buildings and and there was concern raised around sort of isolating spaces it is our feeling because essentially the the single family homes that have been built that you know the skinny homes that are newer because they've been redeveloped that that's that notion of isolation doesn't necessarily apply in the same way where where maybe uh, if you've got an older home beside it is that is that how we look at this yeah i mean we look at it the same way we look at the transition of other major corridors secondary corridors and primary corridors um, the edge of a major node major node is very large scale um it's it's a magnet right so you're gonna to start to see that development pressure, the corridors are developing, um, larger demand for larger buildings, and there could be this awkward stage where it unevenly develops as the years progress, I think, um, but it gets better over time, right? And if we're patient and um, it fills out. So we only have to look further north down 116th Street already to understand the size and scale of what the university um, can achieve over time. Uh, some of those scales towards the north, and it's not that far, 116th Street is not a very long street. Those are 15-story buildings. Um, yeah. You're starting to see all kinds of sale, for sale signs on those single detached on the east side of 116th. Um, we're, we're feeling the pressure of the magnet of that major node. 
Do we, as, as part of that that idea of transition, would we, I guess it's hard to ask a bit of a hypothetical, but I think part of why I'm asking this is because I'm trying to figure out how we're painting this picture to Edmontonians, because if we're saying, okay, this is what's reasonable, six stories here, and that's meant to serve as a transition, would we envision a scenario where those homes right across the alley might in fact be supported if they were four stories? And, and that's sort of how you're envisioning that that transition down. Is that is that generally sort of how we would look at this? Yes, a transition in terms of intensity as we build away from the major node. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm out of time on this round. I might come back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Um, and Councillor Knack, could you actually take the chair, please? Of course, I've got the chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just want to follow up on a few of those questions. Uh, I also wanted to dig into the concept of transition. Um, and I, th I think I'm getting to a, a place of greater clarity that um, I guess it's, so there, there were some suggestions that uh, it's a bit of a gray zone, but I'm hearing from administration, it's pretty clear within the district policy um, that given given the site's proximity to the, the major node, it's kind of right buffering it right on the edge. That, that it is clear within even the drafts and recognizing they're in draft form. It's very clear. Okay. Um, I also wanted to ask about, uh, and maybe this is to legal, uh, one of the speakers brought up uh, some concerns around short-term rentals. Um, I'm just wondering, is, is that, I guess, a valid land use consideration as part of the public hearing today, or is that a different conversation? That's a, that's a different conversation, Councillor Salvador. Um, not a valid yet. Tenure is not a valid yeah. land use consideration. Thank you. Um, and then I just needed clarity on this piece because it, it really flagged for me, and I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, I think there was a suggestion that through zoning bylaw, there had been an upzoning of density by 800%, allowing eight units on a site. I just need to know that's that's not the case. My understanding is uh, going from a maximum of six to, to eight, is that correct? Yeah, that, I think if I was interpreting that, I think it's more about the RS zone um, and kind of a blanket interpretation that when we are limiting those interior sites to eight units, that everyone with an RS, RF1 zone went to RS and now they're allowed to have eight units. So I think I think it's just a broad interpretation of what's happened without the nuance. Okay, okay. But they were allowed six before. They were. Okay, thank you. Um, just wanted to make sure my interpretation was right there. Um, yeah, I think that, that wraps things up for me. Thank you. And I'll take the chair back, Councillor Knack. I'll return the chair. Thank you. And I'm just pausing to see if there's anyone else who has questions for administration. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, so at this time, uh, we'll see if there is any new information um, that has arisen during the public hearing that we would like to discuss. All right, I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, so would any of my colleagues like to move closure? of the public hearing. I'll move closure of the public hearing for Charter Bylaw 20800. Second. Okay, moved by Councillor Wright, seconded by Councillor Tang. Uh, please vote on closure of the public hearing. We have the vote. Please display the vote. That's carried. And I'll move first reading of item 3.9. Seconded by Councillor. Sorry, uh, second. By Councillor Tang, great. So we have first reading on the floor. Um, so anyone to speak to this item? Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Council Salvador. I, I feel like m maybe maybe this is all just a me problem. <laughs> like uh, I I because I I hear the points. I've I've read through these plans, and I and and I'm not feeling the same way about how these plans 
are being portrayed to residents. And, and maybe I need to just get over it or I need to reread some spots that, that I'm having tra challenges with, but I, 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 am, I am worried that I feel like there is a disconnect between what is in these plans and even I would argue what is in the city plan because not unlike a recent conversation, I can see a logical reason why you would have six stories essentially across from the U of A. Appreciating that the site it's immediately across from his parking lot and all of that. And, and yet I, I'm worried that that's not clear. And again, maybe it's just me. Maybe I have I've 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 misunderstood how these plans are being written and the and the lines on the maps that we're using. And um, but I I I feel like this is setting us up for a lot of consistent conversation that that I feel from a if there wasn't a draft plan and we were simply using the city plan, I think it would probably make sense to do six stories here. And then as we heard in some of the questions, you know, probably behind the alley, that's might be where you do four stories and then it would go into the, the standard zoning everywhere else as a, as a general rule of thumb. Um, but when it's not clear, at least again, and again, maybe it's just to me, I think we set different expectations from the community because I, I, I am worried that we have folks here who, who feel like, you know, this has got to be folk for, they're all completely on board with, or at least, the, you know, the, the feedback is generally supportive of, but six is, is sort of a hard stop for them. And I, I'm not sure I see a, a huge material impact from four to six stories on a site like this in this location across from the school exactly where it is there might be a different conversation in other sites and uh, but but for this specific site i'm not sure that that's going to make a substantial difference to the things that have been raised today from those that have concerns so with that being the case how do we how do we advance those conversations in a thoughtful way so that we can we can better understand what we're going to do and where um, and, and, and it's just, maybe it's the fact that, you know, I know we're a month away from those conversations on the district plans, and, and maybe this is part of the messiness of a few, of a few single zone uh, rezoning applications, you know, three to four months out. And so we've got this, this, uh, you know, messy middle, if you will. Um, but, but I, I'm just not seeing how this type of conversation is going to be different even if the draft plans were to be approved as written. So I want to listen to all my other colleagues. I just I, like, yes, I think there's a lot of logical reasons for where, why this specific site should probably be six stories. Um, but I worry about how this is going to continue and how we're working with communities so that they can better understand, you know, where, where we, generally need to see change and where we might see a little less change and how that manages the growth. Again, we've talked about this fact that we have added a red deer into the city limits in the last two years. That's not going to change anytime soon. And so truly, we need to make sure we're building enough to keep up with that growth because we don't, uh, we're, we're not even doing it right now. So <sighs> I feel like I'll, I'll probably support this, not unlike the other um, two applications where I've, I've felt conflicted. Um, but I'm just, again, flagging it for, from again, maybe it's me and I'll just go through and, and, and reflect on this more. But I, I'm just worried how this is, how we're, how we're actually working with communities to, to make sure we're fully understanding what we're facing right now, where we should be changing, where we should be seeing more minimal change and all of that. So. I look forward to hearing some of the co colleagues and uh, my colleagues' comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, Councillor Jantz. Thank you. Um, I uh, I think it was time flies, but I think it was last weekend the mayor's office convened a table of uh, about eight different student organizations in Edmonton, and one of the top issues that they raised with us was the housing crisis and having opportunities for affordable welcoming accommodation close to transit, close to campus, close to where they study, where they could live a life without having to own a car, where they could focus on getting to class, 
and not worried about having to get a second job or third job to pay rent, having more options to choose. Now, one building is the tree. It's not going to solve the problems of the forest. But these students made very clear to us that they wanted more housing and they wanted more choices. And they were very concerned that they couldn't take time away from final exams to come to a public hearing like this, but that they wanted to live in a city where more opportunities would be there, uh, knowing that not all of them can stay in student housing forever, um, that they want to see more vibrancy in the area. Um, they pressed this very hard on providing for more housing choices. And while their voices are not heard at the committee today, I do want to try and, and make sure that those points of view were known. Um, I think this interesting question of who speaks for the neighborhood is is very interesting. I I hear the the positions, the league's position of neutrality. I hear the board Windsor Park Citizens Coalition's coalition uh, position that um, they are displeased with the neutrality and that they are in opposition to this project. Um, and then I've heard from some other neighbors who are actually supportive of this project and are quite pleased with the placement that it's on an arterial. Um, and and a collector, not a not an inter neighborhood project like we saw previously. So um, it you know this is the challenge with representative democracy. No one organization speaks for every one person. No counselor speaks for every one citizen. No MLA, no MP, and so on. So it's very challenging. But I like to. Um, you know, when we when we look at the potential harms of this project and we look at the merits of this project and the contributions, um, they seem to be some mitigations that still need to be undertaken that will be followed up by administration in the development stage. But in general, what we've heard now and at previous public hearings about the need for on the exteriors um, near campus, um, this this project seems to be much more um, aligned with that feedback than um, something more interior to the neighborhood. So um, I'll be supporting the project with those uh, with those caveats noted. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you. And this, uh, I wanna just validate Councillor Knack that I don't, you're not alone in this. I feel the same tension, the same concerns that that you are feeling and we we talked about it with a few other things that have come recently before uh, public hearing so I'm feeling that same sense of deja vu and it, it's similar to you if this was you know and I know we can't take the district plan into consideration so without that I would feel compelled to support this but I do think that if the district plan was in place right now I would have a harder time supporting this and that's a problem. That's a huge problem in my mind. Um, so again, just gonna table it to the conversation on district planning, but flag it again as as a major as a major concern. We need to bring people along with us. And people interpret lines as lines and a, a boundary and a border. And if it's not actually a boundary and a border, I think that's going to be very confusing for people. Um, public trust, public engagement, public participation are all essential pieces of democracy. And so we need to ensure that our actions always align with policy. Um, and it does in the case of the city plan. As mentioned, like, there's, there's no reason that this area shouldn't have higher density. We know we're welcoming more students. We know there's a need. We know uh, this is a high growth area. It's near, near transit, though not directly near transit, within walking distance of transit. All of those things are good. Um, so if our district plan is saying something different, even if it's the interpretation of, of it by two counselors, that means at a percentage, if it's only me and Andrew that, that think that way, uh, Councillor Knack, that's still a percentage of Edmontonians that would likely interpret it the same way, and that's problematic. So again, 
I, I hope that this is considered in the debate around district planning. Um, with with that in mind, of what you know, leaning towards the councillor of the ward and and their support for this project, knowing this area, I will also support it. But I just felt important to say that I have those same tensions that I'm feeling. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Um, Councillor Neff, could you take the chair, please? Yes, I've got the chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to to express my thanks to all the speakers who came out today, uh, both both in support and opposition. Um, and I wanted to just root this conversation in the city plan, uh, because district planning is not and should not be taking us in a different direction than than the city plan. District plans, uh, recognizing they're in draft form, uh, should be providing a greater degree of focus and detail uh, on the city plan. But again, using that city plan as the base. We're not introducing new direction. And when I look at the city plan, I do see very clear alignment. Um, and, and I can absolutely understand why administration has supported this application. Um, are there opportunities to provide greater clarity within district plans? Maybe. Uh, and I think we can have those conversations to make sure it's being interpreted um, as, as clearly as it can and as correctly as it can be. Uh, but in the absence of finalized district plans, I think we can and should still be moving forward on projects that are in alignment with the city plan. Uh, and this project is. It is located within the University Garneau major node uh, under the city plan, close proximity to public and active transit. Uh, it's well connected to amenities that support walkable 15 minute communities. Uh, and it's directly adjacent to a major institutional employment center in our city. Um, and then when I, when I zoom out even further and think about uh, the housing crisis that we are currently experiencing and the housing emergency that this city council declared, um, I, I can't see a good reason why we wouldn't approve this today. Uh, we are in desperate need of student housing uh, and, and I can't think of, of a better location um, directly adjacent to the University of Alberta uh, that is, as, as was mentioned earlier, experiencing substantial growth itself. I do appreciate the concerns that were raised uh, around uh, parking, the parking garage in particular, uh, but I also appreciate the measures that are being uh, put in place to address those concerns and to mitigate some of them. Uh, I also think there are opportunities for supporting uh, traffic safety through some of our safe mobility programming and, and would encourage uh, those folks who are interested in uh, supporting those efforts to, um, you know, reach out through through things like street labs uh, to start working on those pinch points in the neighborhood. Uh, but again, I I do think that this project is uh, is well in line with the direction we need to go, and am happy to support it today. Thank you so much, and I'll take the chair back. And I will go. All right. I'm <laughs> Thank you, and I'll go to Councillor Kurtmel. Great, thank you. Um, many great points that have been raised about, you know, in, at a very high level and very generally speaking, the need for more housing, particularly close to a major institution and, and in a somewhat of a core neighborhood, although it doesn't look like that today. But I have a real apprehension about the conflict between our guiding documents here. And um, given that we're gonna have a, an extended conversation in a little more than a month on the district plans, uh, frankly, I think the best move here would be to uh, put this decision on hold until we have that conversation. But I, I um, realize there's not a lot of support for that for that idea. So, uh, you know, I, it's been said by a few of my colleagues that, uh, you know, they lean towards support today. But if those plans as drafted were approved, they would lean against towards non-support in that instance. And I that doesn't wash for me. I mean, if we're not sure that that this development would pass muster in a month, then why does it pass muster now? So, uh, and I like I hate to to outright reject something because I think there's all kinds of positive aspects to this. Like I said, the you know the the need for more units, uh, the need for more housing, uh, uh, the very clear uh, urgency around affordable housing, uh, not just in Edmonton but across the country. Uh, all of those things uh, are boxes that are checked that make this development appealing. But we have to, to make sure that people know what they're going to expect in their neighborhoods. And uh, you know, when when we've got what amounts to conflicting documentation, um, then I I don't think the right answer is to proceed. I think the answer is to hold fast until we can offer that clarity. So. If we're going to maintain a, a, a binary decision at this point, then uh, I'm leading to no. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Kurtmel. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Ah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this has been a, a really interesting discussion. And uh, Madam Chair, I, I would be inclined to move referral. And so I, that is actually what I'm going to do, moving referral. So we have first reading on, on the floor. So I just looked at the clerk's process here. If uh, Councillor Paquette would like to move referral. Yeah, the process knowledge on that one would be great. Can law please uh, confirm? Another option, Madam Chair, is to postpone this conversation. Sure. I'm just uh, process-wise recognizing that there is a first reading on the floor. I just want to make sure that we we're following the correct orders here. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and um, clerks can certainly chime in if they feel differently. I think at this point, there, such a motion could come forward. From the legal side of things, I think you may want to look until a uh, final determination of um, district plans rather than a first or a second reading. I, I think you probably want to wait till they're finally disposed of if that's sort of the desire, but a referral or a postponement would work. So you could refer it back for until final determination or you could postpone it to final determination. I would recommend a referral out of the two. Okay, so at the appropriate time, uh, Madam Chair, I will move referral rather than voting against uh, consideration. Okay, thank you, Councillor Paquette. And I'm just looking to clerks again. Um, if there's a desire to move referral, would that uh, trump the motion on the floor? What, would we need to withdraw this? What's the process from here? Um, we, yeah, I think uh, you can make a referral, but we need to know when it will be coming back to council. Uh, probably June 10th, I would assume. And maybe I would just look to legal um, around the date. Right. So just as I had suggested, I, I, I don't know that I would put a, a definitive date on it, but I would look, wait until final determination of district plans is my, is my advice. Um, as opposed to doing something in between when you're sort of in a, a bit of a gray area where you're going to be potentially, depending on what happens at the end of May, um, you know, you could be potentially considering some plans that have received first and second reading, or those plans could be referred back or rejected, or there's a number of things that could be happening. So that's why I'm suggesting final determination as opposed to a particular date. Is that acceptable uh, to City Clerk? Yes, we can do to be determined date, and that's acceptable. I, I would rather than to be determined, I would say until final determination of district plans, um, because we don't know what's going to happen, unfortunately. And just so, maybe a question on that. Um, I guess it's possible that those district plans don't move forward at that time, and we're not talking a month from now. We could be talking six, seven. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so something could happen in May. Perhaps they get out right, right rejected. And I'm talking in complete right. hypotheticals here. This would then allow this um, application to come back right after a rejection, right? Because that would be a final determination. Um, they could get. They could get second reading and we could, they could go to the EMRB and we could have to await third reading at some point in the future. So that's why I'm tying it to determination, um, just so that we don't get into a, a sticky situation where we're, we're supposed to bring something back and um, yeah, we can't. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Thank Counselor, you so much. Counselor, if I just uh, add to that opinion, uh, just in terms of the speed and efficiency of a review and a decision by council. Um, as Ms. Ingpin said, there, there is the MRB process uh, as well as the uncertainty of what happens at district plans. Uh, we may want to check in with the applicant just to see in terms of uh, when they want council to make that decision. Um, and it may be beneficial to have it uh, in between that time or June 10th or earlier, just in terms of their business plan and how to bring this site to market or not. Yeah, that's a good point, and we'll, um, we'll come back for new information in a second. But uh, first, I, I actually need a seconder uh, for this referral motion. Second. Okay, so this is moved by Councillor Paquette, seconded by Councillor Knack. Um, 
So we're actually gonna clear the board then and go back to questions of, of the referral uh, or speaking to. So Councillor Stevenson, are you on for questions? Yes, thank you. Just a, a quick question to administration and then happy to speak. The appropriate yes, time. Ahead. So um, I, I'm i just looking for some clarity in terms of whether uh, it's administration's position that this development is currently supported in the in the draft district plans. I was just a bit confused uh, by the session, uh, the section in the report. That, right now, it's just an awkward time for incorporating uh, district plans in the report. Uh, it is very clear to us that there is support in the district plans for this application. Councillor, so, uh, just to add to that, uh, there are two points where there's support. One through the transition policy uh, around the proximity to major nodes and, and corridors that looks to uh, incorporate height and intensity around these uh, areas of activity. And further, there's additional policy uh, added into uh, the district general policy in the latest draft that allows additional height and intensity to be contemplated around collectors or within 100 meters of nodes and corridors that have been identified on it or mass transit lines. Uh, in this case, this site would meet the, the collector and the within the, the distance proximity to that major node, which uh, allows that clear support through district plans through those two policies. Okay, and that's clear support for sort of medium rise development? So, the in in terms of that height and intensity uh we would look at that that context in terms of what is surrounding uh and in this case being the major node uh and the the intensity and the height of buildings in that university area as well as that expected amount of activity uh that's where that six-story support is there i'd look to the team to to add to that and i just just while I have a quick moment, Councillor Stevenson, I just, something that uh, Councillor Knack and Councillor Salvador have hit on, and I just want to get on the record, is, is that these, these district plans, we can have a discussion, they can be considered, but they are a relevant planning consideration, but it depends on the weight that you put on them. And at yes. this point, where they stand in the process, legal would advise that you put little weight on it. But I just wanted to get that on the record, so thank you for giving me that time to do so. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that. I think... Um... You know, I think I think we we are certainly not debating the district plans right now or the clarity of the district plans now. I think maybe just what I wanted to clarify is that um, in terms of advice or or support from administration changing as a result of the passing of the district plans, it doesn't sound like that would occur. Was that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. I'll be uh, speaking in opposition to this at the appropriate time. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Councillor Jans, and I also just want to uh, flag that if there are questions, um, and I guess this is new information uh, for the proponent, um, those questions can be asked at this time as well. Councillor Jans. Um, yeah, I think I'll be speaking in opposition to referral as well, too. Um, I guess, can I ask administration, what date did City Council declare a housing emergency? It was in January of 2024. Okay. And um, am I correct that this, uh, if we were to defer or postpone, this could be months in, or, or, or how, what would, what would the timeline be before this could come back? Uh, there's a number of opportunities and I think it's up to the mover uh, to decide uh, and council uh, willingness, willingly, willingly to decide what date that is. It could come back um, as soon as uh, not the next public hearing, but the next one after that, or right after district plans, or um, further into the future after third reading of district plans. Um, so a number number of complications around that district. Plan. You mean date? When would when would that be? When would those district plans be? The third reading for district plans, if it were to advance, uh, we have it mapped out in August of 2024. Okay, so we talk about at least, at least it would be this construction year would be lost then. Is that an assumption? 
Uh, that would like, be a, a good question for the applicant in terms of how they can prep the site for it, uh, but definitely a significant amount of time lost in terms of that permitting and planning process. Okay, and that would pro that would probably not not be not be helpful in our broader housing um, emergency. Are you aware of uh, vacancy rents or rent rent increases, vacancy rates or rent increases in the area? Like I've heard, I've heard in Garneau, it's less than one percent vacancy, and that rents have gone up twenty percent. Or we the rents are rising the highest rate in Canada. Is that your understanding as well too? Uh, not area specific, but I know Edmonton's rental rate or vacancy rate in general has been decreasing the last couple of years, uh, going down to that functionally two to three percent. This area, I would suspect, being next to the university, would face increasing pressures uh, compared to the rest of the city. Okay, I guess the other part I'm struggling with is, uh, and and I did vote against this project a few months ago, but there was an interior Westrich, uh, I think it was Westrich project across the street from the school, and I believe that passed 12 to 1 at council, even though that one was, there was a question about whether it fit with the district plan or the neighborhood plan. Um, could you remind me of the date when that occurred? Councillor Jans, give us a minute to look it up. I can tell you it has a uh, current development permit in. Okay, like I, th I think it's within the last 12 months though, because I'm worried about sending a message of incongruence to the community that council deemed that that one was okay, but then their ask was do it on the exterior of the neighborhood instead. Yeah. Now there's a proposal to do it on the neighbor edge of the neighborhood instead, and it's being told to hold off. And it, when I hear Councillor Knack or others saying, well, of course, this should be there. If the problem is here, we need to fix the district plans. Councillor Jones, it was within the last 12 months. Um, our, just to clarify for uh, around Councillor Stevenson's first comment and, and question for our report, our report analyzes this application under the city plan. Under the city plan, this is within the major node, and this is supportable. The district so plans, any, yep. We're only so this, this would be more of a this would be more of a criticism that the district plans are not adequately congruent to city plan if there's a misinterpretation here. I, would, uh, I, I think there there is a, a some confusion around the alignment of district plans and city plans. Uh, right now, the draft district plans are fully in aligned with city plan. Uh, it provides uh, a number of points of intensification and direction. Uh, through it, its mapping of the nodes and corridors and then as well as uh, the policy. But again, uh, we don't want to get too far into uh, the district plan, city plan conversation in sure. terms of... Well, maybe maybe uh, can I look at this? So we have, two, we have two LRT stations within a sub 10 minute walk of this project. So based on that, like first principles, if we want transit oriented development, um, is something like that laid out in district plan, like a clear metric like that? So I just want to jump in here. I, we are speaking to a referral motion. If we want to continue to have really some substantive discussions about this application, I suggest we pull back and reopen the public hearing so that we're doing so in the proper forum. Um, if we can keep the questions um, sort of tailored to that referral motion, I think we're okay to go forward as is, but otherwise we should back it up. Um, Madam Chair. Thank you okay, so much for the advice. And okay. I'm just perplexed about the rationale for referral. Thank you, Councillor Jan. Uh, Councillor Knack on referral. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to double check. Uh, I, I appreciate the the guidance as to why we would list the referred back uh, as as stated. Um, I, I would prefer to provide a little more certainty. So I, I would rather have an actual date, recognizing that we might not have closure on that, but have more clarity. So. I would rather amend this. I, I don't know if the original mover ever actually agreed to a specific date, but but I would want to. If he if he has, then I would move to amend to uh, have that come back to the G June tenth public hearing. I did not, and I find that friendly. Okay, I'll look to my colleagues to see if that is friendly. Okay, not. Yeah, not seeing anything uh, that, that appears to not, be friendly. Well, not friendly. Not friendly, okay. Um, so can we have the wording for the uh, amendment? Yeah, so it'd be uh, the striking referred back to administration. And uh, so until um, final determination of the city plans, it would just be until June 10th, uh, the June 10th public hearing. Okay, moved by Councillor Knack. 
uh, seconded by, can we get a seconder on that? Back. By Councillor Carmel. Okay, please vote on the amendment. Yes. Yes, Aaron Rutherford. Yes. Uh, Mr. Prince Pay is a yes. We will uh, cast the vote shortly. We're trying to uh, put the motion up. Councillor Katmel? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford? I am a yes. Thank you, Councillor. We have all the votes. Display the vote. That is carried. Uh, okay, so we'll go back to referral motion. Just wait to see who's remaining on the board. Um, point of order. Yes. Councilor Rutherford? It's now noon. Um, since we're, we still have another item and clearly wouldn't finish this item in short order, could we just recess now and come back to this? Yes, we can, we can do that. And I know some folks have a hard stop at noon. Um, so we will, we will take our noon break and, uh, and come back at 1.30 uh, to wrap up this item. And we still have uh, item 3.10 uh, remaining. So we'll hear from speakers on that after lunch. Uh, thank you so much.
Good afternoon, we are live on YouTube. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting back to order and just begin with a roll call of council colleagues. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. Hello, Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Sohi is not with us. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, okay. So uh, just getting back to the motion here for, for postponement, um, I just want to check in. Uh, to see if there might be a restatement of the motion. Um, I know there was some recommended wording from the clerks. Uh, if someone would like to restate that, Councillor Paquette, are you? Oh, if you, I may, oh. um, Madam Chair, I just, just ch chatting with our clerk here. Um, we are going to look for a restatement in terms of postponement, but we would want it to say postponement to the June 10th date, not and final determination. It's an either or situation. So it would be postponed to June 10th. So I just wanted to make sure the correct motion was up there. So I'm just buying us a little bit of time right now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Sorry for the confusion, nope, but um, final determination on June 10th could create a conflict, as I'm sure you can imagine. So we're just going to restate that. I just had a chat with Tracy there. Okay. Thank you, and thanks for the time there. Yeah, no no worries at all. Um, okay, well, th with that in mind then, uh, Councillor Knack, I know you were next up on the board uh, for questions, I believe? Uh, no, I, I think no? I asked my question, or there may be amendments, so I I'm not don't need to be on the board anymore. Thank you. Okay, then I'll just pause to see if there's any other uh, further questions from colleagues. Um, I know there are a few folks who wanted to speak to this postponement. Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you very much. I'm just wondering, with it being postponed to June 10th, if we're still not any further ahead in the district planning, can it be postponed further or would a final decision have to be made at that time? It's entirely within council's purview whether or not they postpone an item. So if we get to June 10th and that's the, that's the desire of this council, then you would be within your rights to do that. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Thanks, Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Jans, are you on to speak? To speak, please. Okay, uh, I'm also on to speak. So, Councillor Jans, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Just very quickly, um, it's in, it's interesting that many many of the colleague many of my colleagues today say said something to the effect of their concern is not with the project; it's it's with potential congruency to the district plan drafts. Um, and everybody sort of acknowledged that this is what city plan is calling for. And um, given the fact that, you know, this is a land use planning decision, what we need to consider is not what some draft um, plan may, may or may not or may include, but what we need to look at is, is this an appropriate um, land use in this location at this time? And, and I, for one, as a board councillor, think this is a far more suitable location than potential in, in interior locations that could be considered um and and as such i um apprehensive i'm apprehensive about rolling the dice and seeing you know a different project a different height a different scale a different location coming forward 
And um, I think we've heard some of that recognition from the community as well, too. So putting aside the, the and, and I mean, putting aside the district plan conversation, because that's not the debate we're having today. And I think we all acknowledge there's, you know, there's there's uh, some some changes we'd like to see there. But looking at city plan, which is our which is our 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 nest, our like in the nesting legislation, the city plan trumps all. The city plan is very clear that this this sort of a project in this location steps to an LRT um, is really important for our city plan goals, um, and as such should be considered. And I think um, because of a draft conversation we haven't had yet for council to vote down housing right now beside the university on Earth Day during a climate emergency, during a housing emergency, uh, would be absolutely sending the wrong signal to the city, to our, our citizens, to our neighbors, and and I think would be unfair to the Windsor Park neighborhood who may um, see something mu much, much different that they that they may be certainly less amenable to in future. So I would urge my colleagues to show their commitment to city plan um, and uh, show their commitment to um, the uh, um, the uh, the major emergencies that we have before us, and uh, um, let the other let the other quarrels take their day when they come. But right now, as legalists, you know, reminded us, uh, this is a land use planning decision, and um, as we heard from many of the folks here today, that um, we we can't wait. I don't want to go back to those student leaders in a few weeks and. When they say, "Hey, what happened to that housing?" You prom, you, you know, you and you and council promised that you'd be working on. Um, I don't want to say, "Well, we're putting a lot of housing decisions on hold until we review these draft, draft, you know, district planning conversations." Because um, I, I think that's a mistake, and I think and I think putting a hold right now would send a message to other projects in other areas around the city. I think there could be um, quite a lot of aftershocks here that. Um, I, I don't think is the message we want to be sending right now. There, we deliberately chose the phrase a housing emergency and we need to act like it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Um, Councillor Nack, can you please take the chair? I've got the chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just be very brief. Uh, I, I agree with my colleague, Councillor Jans, uh, and, and won't repeat um, some of the reasons why, why I initially wanted to, to support this, um, but I will just underscore why um, I, I won't be able to support uh, any sort of delay or postponement. You know, what, what really uh, stands out to me is I don't think it's going to get us to, to a different place. We heard from administration that their recommendation of support uh, for this rezoning would remain regardless of whether or not um, this is postponed or delayed, and, and that is because it is in line with the city plan. Um, when we look at the hierarchy of our, our guiding planning documents, we know that city plan is our North Star. We say that a lot around this table, uh, and if there is a desire to you know, work on, on further clarity around district plans. We can have that conversation, but, but that's, not, um, that's not in front of us today. And, and today's decision is not dependent on that because district plans uh, are in line and should be in line with the city plan, um, which, which we heard from administration, even in their draft form, they are. Um, but, but again, looking solely at city plan, uh, which is a very valid thing to do, um, given the weighting that, that we, can, uh, we can give to the draft district plans at this time, um, I, I do not feel it's appropriate to postpone. So thank you. I'll, ret or I'll take the chair back. I'll return the chair. Thank you, and uh, I'll go to Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you know, really echoing those, those comments, um, I, I think as we heard uh, very clearly from administration, additional time doesn't lead to, to a different recommendation. Uh, what's before us is uh, in line with city plan and and actually in line with district planning. Well, the draft district plans, while we're not necessarily giving those much weight, I think that's a really important consideration. Um, what what I what I do think uh, delay in time can do though is create uncertainty. Um, can create a lack of clarity even further for the community in terms of what what the future vision is for the area. Um, you know, and that's not to say that transition isn't hard. It is hard when neighborhoods are shifting. We, we heard that throughout the public hearing today. It's also hard when our policy frameworks are shifting. Um, but for, for weeks and months that we have known district planning is underway, we have been approving. We have been able to make those decisions, again, going back to city plan. 
I don't see anything different in this instance. Um, and for me, it's important that we we move forward with with the confidence that we have in that plan and our confidence in and commitment to, to implementing it. I think certainly this has raised important questions about clarity in district plan, and I think that's a conversation for us to have in May. Um, but again, I don't believe that that discussion has bearing on the decision before us, so I will not be supporting this referral motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Um, Councillor Neck. Uh, thanks, Councillor Salvador. Oh, it's, I, I hate it here sometimes. It's, well, it's more like a love-hate relationship because, like, completely, I, I understand the points I've just heard. I, I feel they're very thoughtful. I can completely understand why someone wouldn't vote to postpone. I, I come back to a few things, is that um, what we're talking about, though, is seven weeks right now. This proposal would ask to come back in seven weeks. So I, I don't necessarily agree with the perspective that this is putting on hold all of our land use decisions. You know, we've just gone through an entire uh, number of other items that were all approved. This is right now one item, and who, I don't know what's on the next public hearing agenda. You know, maybe there's another one there. So, so realistically, you know, it's one, and who knows what's next week? Maybe two. Um, and, and so I, I don't think it sends that kind of signal that, that's being suggested that somehow by waiting seven weeks, we are uh, essentially undermining uh, our, our city plan or the district plans. I think we, we've been very clear about the desire of the district plans. I heard in most of my colleagues' uh, remarks that, that overall there's a general desire to advance this. Um, and, and I also appreciate the point, though, and I, I agree that I don't think more time is going to lead to a different recommendation from administration. But here's what I'm going to come back to. Because it's not just about how did it end, it's about the process to get to the end. And I know, and you know, I, I think I've shared this a handful of times over the years, but maybe not in this term, but like in my first term, there were times where I actually voted against row housing on a corner lot, um, not because I felt it was uh, inappropriate, but because we were in the process of a process to develop a plan that people could refer to and use that as guidance as to what was going to happen. And I do worry about um, not bringing community along. Again, that doesn't mean the community is going to agree with the outcome. I, I've already spoke to that item uh, about how I think there's a lot of reasons that might make sense. So I get the folks that spoke in opposition are still not going to like that answer. Um, but what I do think is that if we actually are really clear with how we're communicating these plans, how we're developing these plans, and if we take a couple of weeks to provide that refinement, to provide that greater guidance and clarity, it, we can have a better outcome, even if some folks don't get the outcome that they're looking for. So for me, I, I think referral for seven weeks is not uh, a hardship. It's not going to send any mixed signals. In fact, I think it gives us an opportunity to maybe be more clear about where we need to head as part of our overall growth in the city. I mean, I, we have a very important guiding document in the city plan. I, we're going to have some very important documents coming forward at the end of May about the district plans. It's how we're developing those, how we're communicating those, and how they properly reflect the overall uh, path forward. So I'm supportive of, of uh, postponing the seven weeks. I, I wouldn't want to go any longer. I think that's that's unreasonable. We'll have one, we'll have a general sense of where we're going uh, by the end of May either way. So uh, happy to wait on this particular piece. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nat. Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you. Um, I uh, I supported earlier um, the amendment so that there is some certainty when it comes to the specific day, but I don't support the postponement mentioned in this case. And I think, yes, to Councillor Nass, point, we, you know, postponing it so that we have uh, some of the pieces in place when it comes to district plan will be helpful. But I look back, um, there were decisions for rezoning, you know, prior to the zoning bylaw renewal public hearing that could have been postponed because it would have been they may not necessarily have to come forward and we could have postponed that. And I, there were definitely instances that we, we didn't um, because the city plan offered enough information and guidance. Um, and I think I feel similarly today that I have enough information um, as of today to, to make a decision on this. And I don't see um, what, like what additional benefit will come from postponing it for another seven weeks. 
I am constantly reminded, and it's been said many times before by my colleagues, by uh, many others, that land use is the most important tool we have for climate uh, and housing. And given both of those emergencies we have declared, um, I, I will hesitate to, to postpone decisions like this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I, I've been listening to this very carefully. Um, I'm inclined to agree with Councillor Knack and Councillor Rutherford's perspective on this. Um, I, I take the points of my colleagues very clearly, especially in terms of surety, um, uh, sort of pace of development. But I, um, when Councillor Knack says uh, um, it's not where you end up, it's the process that gets you there. I feel that a lot in communities and having, um, I, I think even the amount of confusion today over what the general direction and weighting is of district plans, is that, that to me was a case in point that um, there's an interpretation of it in community and even in administration that I'm not sure that council shares. And I think that having a little bit more strength of definition around how much weighting we are going to apply to district plans would um, help communities along with this process a great deal. And I think it would help administration along in this process a great deal. So I'm inclined to support postponement um, to the June 10th uh, meeting at this time. And um, I want to just thank my colleagues for just making it really interesting points in what has turned out to be a very interesting debate today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Paquette, would you like to close? I'm just checking. Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So, yeah, this is a, a fascinating conversation. I've actually enjoyed every second of it. Um, I think we're in a, an interesting place, sort of, uh, as far as planning and policy goes, uh, where things are uh, sort of decided, but also sort of in flux. And we've got some, a little bit of work to do. And uh, this item is just falling right in the middle of it. And frankly, I, I, I'm really reluctant to do this, but I'm going to say something nice about Councillor Knack. And uh, that is that he has his finger on the pulse of uh, the folks that he serves. And he, he could give a clinic to other uh Councillors across Canada about how to do that. And in this case, you know, I know that Councillor Nack is always a proponent for smart densification and smart development. And he's championed it time and time again, even when it was politically difficult for him to do so. And so in this case, when he is um, in favor of a brief, brief postponement, I'm inclined to trust that instinct. And I'm inclined to trust that analysis. And so it is a brief pause, but if it gives time to get the clarity and the buy-in that is needed uh, that will essentially solve a lot of other potential things that are coming uh, up on the docket, then I think that's probably a prudent move. If I were forced to vote today uh, on this issue, um, I would, uh, but I would not be comfortable with it. And if I'm feeling that way, I can't imagine how uh, some others feel. So, and you, by the way, you've heard me time and time again, also advocating for uh, things to move forward because it made sense. Um, and in this case, I just have some small hesitations about some things that just have not yet been addressed that I think should be. And that's why I put the motion forward. That's why I support Councillor Knack uh, in this. And um, as, as was mentioned, uh, our development is not slowing down. Um, and we do have a massive influx of people coming in to Edmonton, which means that Housing prices will rise and there will be a little bit more pressure there. And so I understand completely the desire to, to get moving on every single possible thing as fast as possible. But we got, also have to make sure that we're not tripping over our feet. So um, I hope that this finds some support. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Paquette. Please vote.
and my tab closed, I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Piquet. Councillor Witterford. Sorry, I was in the council meeting for tomorrow. I'm I'm a no. Thank you, Councillor. We have voted vote. Display the vote. That is defeated on a tie. All right. Um, so I guess that would that take us back to first first reading, and do we need to move that again? I know we had already we had already moved that. Just to. It's already been moved. Okay, perfect. So. Perfect. Um, okay. And I know we had folks speaking to first reading. Um, not seeing. Oh, I'll give a second and just pause if there's anyone else on the board to speak to first reading. Not seeing anyone. Uh, please vote on first reading. Yes. Thank you, Councillor. We have a vote. Please display the vote. That's carried. Someone like to move second reading? Sorry, I will move second reading of item 3.9. I can second. Great, please vote on second reading. We have other votes. Display the vote. That's carried. And I will move consideration for third reading. Second. Please vote on consideration of third reading. We have other votes. Display the vote. That's carried. And I will move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20800. Second. Please vote on third and final reading. We have voted vote. Display the vote. That is carried. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, that deals with 3.9, uh, which means we're moving on to uh, 310, Charter Bylaw 20736, the Omnibus Text Amendments to Zoning Bylaw um, 20,001. 20, uh, so we will just switch out the administration delegation here. Okay, and we'll hand it over to administration for a presentation uh, when they're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Charter Bylaw 20736 represents the first slate of omnibus amendments to Zoning Bylaw 20001. Next slide, please. The Zoning Bylaw is the rule book for development in Edmonton. It was created to help address many of the directions set out in the city plan. The Zoning Bylaw provides a simplified and streamlined regulatory system to support these goals and was designed to be adaptable over time. In order to ensure Zoning Bylaw 20001 is performing as intended, administration is proposing its first update through this omnibus. Next slide, please. This package proposes 58 amendments, which can be broken down into the following broader categories. Fixes to minor errors, such as correcting typos, fixing subsection reference errors, and other grammatical mistakes that may lead to the misinterpretation of a regulation. Secondly, responding to unintended consequences. This includes updates to accommodate situations or outcomes that were not contemplated as part of the renewal or to correct an outcome that was not intended. And thirdly, performance improvements. These are adjustments to ensure the bylaw is performing effectively. These amendments were identified by administration as well as stakeholders. Next slide, please. For backyard housing, we are proposing to reduce the separation distance requirements between two or more backyard housing buildings on the same site to allow for more flexibility on how backyard housing is developed and to align with accessory building separation regulations. A three meter separation would still be required between backyard housing and another principal building on the site. 
for the RSF, Small Scale Flex Residential Zone, which is primarily used in newer developing communities, we are proposing to enable narrower sites for sites on a local road that abut an alley and sites that have reverse housing. This would allow for a site width of 5.5 meters in these situations. This is intended to accommodate a greater diversity of housing forms that are in demand in these areas, while also reducing unintended non-conformance issues that occurred when parcels that were previously zoned RLD were rezoned to the RSF zone, as RLD did not have a minimum site width. Next slide, please. We are proposing an amendment to the inclusive design section to allow for a bathroom, kitchen, laundry facility, and bedroom to be on a different floor as the barrier-free entrance to a dwelling or a stair lift or elevator is provided at the time of construction. Currently, all these facilities are required to be on the same floor, which is creating barriers for certain housing forms that can make use of this incentive. This change is intended to enable inclusive backyard housing development where a garage is on the first floor and the dwelling above while still maintaining accessibility. Next slide, please. Administration will continue to listen, monitor, and adjust where needed as Edmontonians continue to use this new zoning bylaw. Our feedback form is one key way Edmontonians can share their feedback on how, how the zoning bylaw is performing. The next omnibus amendment is scheduled for quarter four of 2024. Next slide, please. Administration recommends City Council approve this charter bylaw. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, we have uh, two folks in favor, but they're to answer questions only. Um, so I might just pause to see if uh, any colleagues have questions for either Shane Guerin or Elise Shillington before we move on to uh, the one speaker we have in opposition. Not seeing anyone. Um, so I will uh, just invite our speaker in opposition, uh, Speaker Elaine Solas, to uh, come down to the front. And the clerks will just guide you to, actually, you can just go to the podium. There um, we go. Chair, uh, Salvador, can yes. we confirm if uh, Councillor Jans is not uh, having a question oh. for? Oh, hi, Councillor Jans. Are you, uh, do you have questions for those in favor? I can hold off and ask the question to the person in opposition and then administration. Sure, um, that works as well. So, uh, Speaker Solas, you have five minutes, and uh, you you know the drill. So, I'll hand it over to you. Um, I'm not here to oppose the omnibus. I, I, you know, you have to out sign up in opposition if you have a suggestion for something different or a concern. So that's what I'm uh, here to do, and I'm speaking today on this afternoon on this item on behalf of the Skona District uh, communities. We discussed the omnibus at our um, March meeting and uh, the um, item that um, we have a bit of concern about that we wanted to address council on today is in uh, part seven, it has to do with the signage that's posted, the changes to the signage that's posted when there is a rezoning application, and it may apply to when there's a sign posted with regard to a development permit, but that I'm, I'm not uh, entirely clear on. Uh, but in the uh, change um, here in the markup, it's um, on page 46, it's in section 7.50, and there's a, um, there's a series of uh, requirements uh, for uh, signage, um, and they have a 410, one through eight numbering. Uh, 410-6 uh, used to require that the telephone number and email address of the development planner for the public inquiries regarding the rezoning amendment uh, be included uh, on the sign, and that's being changed to a general statement about contact, providing contact information for the city. And what I um, am here to say is that um, regardless of whether you make this change or not, I want to talk about how important it is to have, to be able to talk to and write to the um, uh, people who are involved in a particular rezoning, the city staff, as well as the um, uh, people up, uh, who are working on behalf of the developer. It has clarified so many things for me over the years and for other 
um, people who are involved in uh, this kind of, um, of activity in their neighborhoods. Uh, and it has also provided the opportunity to provide uh, in our own input. Um, and it's important to provide that input in writing uh, because you want, if you're, especially if you're providing input on behalf of a community league or another organization so that the members uh, and the other people are aware of what you've provided and you can, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, you don't have those kinds of uh, comments, well, well, what did they say? What did they really say? Because we think the administration uh, misinterpreted what they said. You know, it, it just is good to be able to have written, be able to do um, written, um, uh, provide written information. Uh, and as you saw on the previous item, that we did provide in, written information and it was used and we talked when we spoke to it. So that that's really all we're we're saying that um, I don't know that it has to be um, a specific uh, you know that names have to be given. I, we understand that there's some concern about um, safety and harassment that there have been um, uh, city staff have been harassed on the phone and online, um, and that's terribly unfortunate and unacceptable. Um, but we don't also don't want it to become just a black box. So that would be that would be what uh, we're t we'd like to uh, say on this point that we'd like to be able to make to have some assurance that we'd be able to continue to speak to and email and exchange emails with city staff working on these uh, rezoning projects. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I do see some some colleagues on the board. So, uh, Councilor Jans, questions to uh, Ms. Solis? No, actually, I'll ask them up administration. Okay, okay Councilor Stevenson? Sorry, also for administration. Okay. Uh, okay, well, it sounds like you had a, a pretty comprehensive presentation then. Uh, we will go over to administration. Councilor Jans? Thank you. Um, very. I mean, I think Ms. Solis summarized it very well, how helpful that contact information is. Just wanted to ask administration their interpretation of what contact information for the city in 4106 would mean. Thank you for the question, Councillor. I think Speaker Solis was on the right track in terms of the uh, flexibility of the type of contact information that administration would provide for applications is something that uh, we're, we're looking for, um, particularly due to issues that we've had with harassment, with full legal first and last names of our planners showing up on all these signs. This is in no way an intention, our intention to um, m reduce the amount of contactability or engagement uh, that Edmontonians can have with administration. That is not the intent. The intent is just to uh, provide us the flexibility to be able to uh, provide, uh, not have to provide full names, but, all, but contact will always be provided on these signs. I, th I think that's a really good change. I think having a universal, like, uh, um, either, uh, you know, project-based name or something that's easier to spell would also improve uh, lost emails between the number of people who spell my name wrong, for instance, is uh, um, considerable. You, um, but yeah, that's great. Um, sorry, one second. I just have to cough. Pardon me. I had a, I had a, may I ask a separate question of administration about the project in general? Yeah, yes. So um, I appreciate these. These are general good housekeeping amendments. I was wondering if you could help me out where we're at on some of the landscaping and drainage and water requirements. Um, what are we expecting that those would come to a future omnibus or are they still under consideration or? There, there is a report coming back um, to, I believe, directly to public hearing with regards to a motion, I believe, made by Councillor Rutherford for the minimum number of tree plantings for small-scale residential. Um, but we do have other bylaws and reports coming as well related to landscaping and trees. Right. So specifically, I was interested in, um, I, I learned another jurisdiction legally requires you to hold 15, mil 15 millimeters of water on your property. Um, that you have to provide a drainage plan that shows that you're absorbing into your own property and um, some of these LID type changes. Now, 
I'm wondering, would they be incorporated through some of the existing motions? Would they be incorporated through like um, uh, an EPCOR water review? Like um, what are what are some of the ways to talk about um, drainage and water conservation going forward? Councillor Jitinda Timana over here. So uh, EPCOR is in process of implementing the uh, SERP, which is, uh, and as well as sanitary IRP. So outcome of those would be increased uh, dependent, dependence on uh, LID features. Uh, so that's an ongoing work. Uh, Th that'll be implemented uh, based on the specific needs of a particular area. Not all areas of the city need it uh, based on the system capacities. So that's an ongoing work uh, which uh, is uh, essentially carried for at the time of development permit. So I don't think there is a specific uh, motion asking for those. So that's not going to be addressed uh, via the zoning bylaw. Councillor, just to add, uh, there's a number of pieces moving. Uh, right now we have the climate development uh, planning framework uh, report that's going to come back to outline possible options to implement climate resilience and climate and energy transition through our various planning, frame, pl planning processes, including the zoning bylaw. Uh, we, we had a work plan report to committee uh, two weeks ago, which outlines all of the motions that we are addressing and the current work that we are doing uh, right now. Uh, so just point you towards that one. Uh, that may help uh, with some of your questions, but in terms of the, the drainage piece, uh, that may be uh, a question or a, a point best addressed at the uh, the climate development planning framework. Excellent. I know drought is on many of our minds right now. So yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I feel like to Ms. Solis that administration has addressed the concern and shares the sentiment, so I won't be moving any further amendment here. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you so much. Really appreciate the report. And, you know, these are not questions I would have asked if it hadn't been pulled. I just want a bit of clarification on the PU public utility zone. Um, so I appreciate the work that's being done to make sure that signs are being sort of considered as a second use. I was a bit confused with parks not being able to be or parks requiring at least one additional use on a public utility zone. Looking at the other uses that are permitted in the zone, it wasn't clear to me that uh, like a stormwater management pond would be, is that considered another use? Is that a minor utility? Um, it would depend on the context of, of what the land is being used. So if we're talking about a PU, specifically public utility zone, um, a stormwater management pond would fall under a minor utility. Minor utility, okay. That, that wasn't included in the list of, um, of sort of typical uses of minor utility, but understanding that, I just, I think most of the P, PU zoning rezonings that we see are just for stormwater facilities that, that incorporate some level of parkland. So as long as this amendment doesn't conflict with that. I'm hearing that it won't, that the, the stormwater will be considered a minor utility and therefore the park can be the second use on site. It, it shouldn't, but it's something administration will take back. And if, if we identify uh, another amendment we need to make in our next omnibus, we'll make sure that happens. Okay, great. And you know, I should have started by saying omnibuses are always a huge amount of work. I actually think it's impressive sort of how, how few errors there were, to be honest, like with such a huge undertaking. Um, so, so very impressive overall, really appreciate the work that went into this. The only other question I had on uh, Amendment 27, and I couldn't, couldn't suss it out with just the bylaw text either, just the addition, I just can't understand the sentence, uh, principal dwelling directly to an abutting sidewalk street where no sidewalk exists. Like I, I feel like a comma is missing or a strike through of the sidewalk is missing and I couldn't couldn't understand it in the charter bylaw. Could you maybe just walk me through what the outcome of the amendment will be? Sorry, I'm, this was a very big file. I'm just rereading it. Yes, <laughs> please. fair enough. Um, 
and maybe you know if, if it's not something we can answer on the spot I don't think it's it will do any harm if it's passed as is but maybe just another flag um, in terms of some some greater clarity sure thank you uh, we will flag that and uh, sidewalks sidewalks needs to be deleted according to our file planner so that's something we will be correcting Perfect. And if we can do that on the fly, happy to do it. But again, not a big deal. Really appreciate all the work. It's very excellent. And, and again, I think great news that, that these are all really quite minor, uh, given given the, the scope of the amendment uh, that was made with the new bylaw. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I have a, a few sets of questions here, actually. Um, my first one is related to the minimum site width from seven meters to 5.5 meters in the RSF zone residential. And I guess I just needed a bit more context because I, you know, I, I understand needing to, you know, make sure that we're, we're, we're having this function the way it's supposed to, but also three months doesn't seem like a very big um, indicator. And it seems like this, we put a lot of thought into the these sort of setbacks and minimum widths and all of those kind of things in the in the recent overhaul. So this seemed like actually quite a big change compared to some of the other minor text amendments. Can administration speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, the one of the philosophies of this new zoning bala was to be as future proofed as possible, and so. When we brought forward the RSF zone in its current state, um, one of the unintended reductions in development potential was uh, the increase of minimum site width. Well, there was no actual minimum site width under the RLD zone, which is where most of the RSF rezonings actually ended up occurring. So there's there are some subdivisions. My understanding there are some subdivisions that were contemplating sub seven point five meter site widths for single detached housing that were now uh, no longer able to be built with that build form. Further, uh, the intent is also to ensure that we strive as much as possible as administration to bring forward less direct controls. So we had indicators early on, as early as. Q4 of last year from industry um, in developing areas that they were going to be proposing a, a product that could not possibly be accommodated with um, with the existing uh, regulations under the new bylaw, which would have been possible under the previous bylaw. Okay. And so I just also want to confirm a similar line of questioning. I know I asked a bit at committee, but I know that there was some apprehension with administration already in previous discussions about the, the number of trees required for landscaping and thought lot sizes. So does this interplay with that other motion that's coming back for further debate? Does this decision have any pending on that? It, it should not. Um, the short answer is no, it, sh it should not. This was not contemplated. Because there's already, there was already when we originally, because the bylaw previously had two tree, minimum tree requirements for landscaping, right. these, these products were allowed. Then we changed the bylaw. The product unintentionally is no longer able to be built. So we're trying to rectify that. So in theory, putting two trees or one tree shouldn't matter because that was already something they would have had to do. Is is my logic following that? Is that correct? Is my summary correct? Your, your summary is correct. And I would just reiterate, we did not as administration review the changes to site with concurrently with that motion that is being addressed in the June report. Mm -hmm. And why was that again? This this file started significantly earlier um, in terms of timing and circulation. Okay. And, yeah. Okay. And um, 
with the supportive housing and rural residential. I had a question about that. I, I, I mean, I get the intent that we have residential, we should allow supportive, but I thought that there wasn't in, in the rural residential, are there a lot of new builds or isn't it is more historical? Councillor, uh, they have uh, development rights wherein uh, they can do new builds. Mm. So this would address that. Okay, okay, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice? Uh, thank you. And I have some questions and similar as uh, Councillor Rutherford, and I got the answer for that. Uh, thank you. And for the presentation and for the changes, amendments presented here. Uh, I have uh, one question related to those amendments, uh, public hearing that we are doing right now. Um, because the last year when we proved this new only bylaw, we heard lots of concerns and from some some of Edmontonians and specifically uh, those concerns and based on the process right now still have the opportunity to reflect in the amendments in the future, not only today. So is that understanding correct? It's my understanding that council can provide a motion to administration. If it's passed, we are going to do the work. Okay, because today's amendment is more from uh, administration, not the council initiative. Then my next question related to this is um, the public engagement and for any amendments initiated by city administration. I, I do notice there, um, there is a form provided and in December last year, 2023, um, to Edmontonians to for their feedback uh, on the new zoning bylaw. And is there any like the um, seminar public process like notice or the information session or other type of engagement to reflect uh, the awareness of Edmontonians for all those amendments presented in today? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, as the zoning bylaw team has now completed renewal and moves into more of an operational maintenance style of, of work, uh, we are examining and continue to develop how we engage, when we engage, depending on the topic, um, depending on the scope of the work that is involved. Um, and this particular uh, the form that I, I shared at the end of the presentation will remain open for at least the rest of this year to continue to refine, to continue to correct errors. Um, that we may not have identified in this package as well. And yeah, we, we, com we are going to continue to communicate. We're going to continue to engage. How and, and the level to which we do it will depend on the project and it will depend on the scope and the sensitivities as well as the resourcing available. But the engagement is not gonna stop. Okay, so they can, the engagement will continue and the Edmontonians still have opportunity to pro provide their inputs or feedbacks and regarding how we imp implement this new zoning bylaw. That is so the intent, yes. Okay, thank you. That's all my question. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Tang. Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, uh, I don't have the urban planning report in front of me, but as part of the work plan, this is you know the first of many you know, milestone we still have to achieve um, when it comes to implementing a uh, zoning bylaw renewal, correct? Yes, you are correct, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just to follow up on that question about the rural residential inclusion of supportive housing that Councillor Rutherford was asking about, because I guess it just piqued, piqued my interest. So I, I, I know we want to have that flexibility should people choose to, um, you know, incorporate, but I was like, it is... Are, are the rural areas the best places to have supportive housing given sort of limited compared to other places, amenities, um, access and that kind of stuff? I, I believe you are correct. Um, the idea is just flexibility of development rights that previously existed as well um, and the ability to still build new. Um, okay. like, likely they aren't going to show up that often naturally or at all, but it's it's... It's an option, at least for, for folks. 
Gotcha. Thank you. Um, and then also, I think this is under number 32 in attachment two, but, um, or I could be wrong. I don't have it in front of me, just switching screens here, but can you just <laughs> remind me the distinction between long-term versus short-term bike parking? Is 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 long-term like the 10%? Is that kind of like a locked bike cage, that kind of stuff versus the bike racks that could be outside of a building, for example? I'm going to ask our file planner, uh, Daniel Morin, to answer that question. Uh, that is correct. The long-term bike parking is for those more like longer stays at a building or an office, uh, multi-unit housing, it's usually secured and it's required to be secured in the bylaw versus that short-term bike parking would be for short visits, restaurant visitors, stuff like that. Yeah, and um, okay. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for that distinction. And then I guess just back to some of the points raised by the speaker earlier. Um, you know, this omnibus doesn't negate the fact that people can still very much provide written submission, correct? Absolutely correct, yes. Yeah, um, and it's just that it's not going to be a specific person, but maybe it, it's similar to other policy discussions we've had, like zoning bylaw or district plan. There's a general email and there will be a team, given that most applications does take multiple teams, um, kind of review the the, the application, it will, there will be a bit of a um triage process and making sure the right person but to, it will be a person who will ultimately respond to residents right that is correct it just provides administration the business operational flexibility to determine when there may be situations where we will put an entire development planner's first and last name um but it at least provides us the option to not do that and, uh, and find a more efficient or a more appropriate method of doing that yeah, okay, uh, that's that's uh, good to know. Thank you very much. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Uh, so I'm not seeing anyone else on the board. Would someone like to move um, close? Well, actually, I'll just, just check quickly uh, for any, any new information or questions arising out of the discussion. If not, I'll look to someone to move closure of the public hearing. Uh, I can move closing of public hearing. Second. Okay. Moved by Councillor Tang, seconded by Councillor Wright. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Uh, I can move first reading. Second. Uh, moved by Councillor Tang, second by Councillor Wright. We have first reading on the floor. Um, anyone to speak to this item? Um, I'll briefly, briefly just speak. Councillor Knack, if you could take the chair. I've got the chair. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'll be very brief, but I just wanted to, to express my thanks and gratitude to administration for, for this. Um, I think it's incredibly impressive that this is a rather small list of <laughs> amendments given the uh, the scope and scale of the zoning bylaw renewal and um, just speaks to uh, your team's ability to um, be, be agile and, and flexible and make those changes where necessary to ensure that we're implementing this in, in the best way possible. So thank you. And I'll take the chair back. I'll return the chair. Great, uh, please vote. Our oh, sorry, Tang. I can. Oh, <clears throat> Councillor Tang, would you like oh, to close? Yeah. yeah, just very briefly, you know, I recognize this is part of the ongoing iterative, you know, constant improvement process as uh, this fairly major bylaw is implemented. Um, you know, I just recall sort of the work plan that was in front of us, I think, you know, a week or so ago that it was, it's fairly comprehensive. There are still many checkpoints and still, you know, um, Lots of ways for people to provide feedback, and I think, for example, the feedback we heard today is 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 um, very valuable, and definitely want to, um, you know, the, offer the reassurance that uh, I, I think engagement with uh, and interactions with the members of the public when it comes to any kind of application is still very much part of this process. Uh, it may look slightly different, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be for the worse. It could potentially improve the process, and I think we, uh, I appreciate that this is an ongoing um, conversation as the bylaw is implemented. So thanks to the team for the work on this. That's all. Thanks, Councillor Tang. Uh, now we can vote. We have all the votes. Display the vote. 
That's carried. Uh, I can move second reading. Second. Please vote on second reading. We have voted vote. Display the vote. That is carried. I'll move for consideration for third reading. Second. Please vote on consideration. We have vote vote. Display the vote. That's carried. And I'll move uh, the final reading of the uh, Charter Bylaw 20736. Second. Okay. Please vote on third and final reading. We have voted vote. Display the vote. That is carried. Excellent. Uh, so that wraps up uh, item 3.10, which means um, we, we've completed all of our items. I'll uh, just look to notices of motion, motions without customary notice, uh, none that I'm aware of, which means we are adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone.